Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, listeners from coast to coast worldwide to the Hagman and Hagman Report. Today is a live broadcast. It is Wednesday, February 20th, 2013. My name is Doug Hagman. With me is my co-host, my son, uh, Joe Hagman. Together we are the Hagman and Hagman Report. And I just want to wish everyone a, a terrific Wednesday. Thank you very much for joining us. We have a very special program tonight. Uh, but before we get into the program, I just want to uh, say, Joe, welcome to tonight's program. Glad to be here. We are going to be joined by special guest Steve Quayle, uh, talking about the return of the days of Noah. And he, he, exactly. And, and, you know, what if everything, folks, and think about this, what if everything you had been taught about ancient history turned out to be almost 100%, we'll say 90% false? What if you found out that the myths, the legends of old were based on voluminous archaeological and skeletal finds that that detail an alternate explanation and filled in the question marks and gaps in explaining true history. Well, I gotta tell you, Genesis 6, Giants, written by Steve Quayle, provides you with the key to unlocking prehist uh, prehistory and ancient history. Genesis 6 will make you question who keeps the truth hidden and why. And in my hands, I've got a copy of Genesis 6, one of the I'll tell you what, why, to me, Steve's never written a bad book, uh, but this book it answers a lot of significant questions, some things that we talk about, some things that Tom Horn and, and, and Steve and, and even, even us during our regular programming talk about. Uh, but, but Giant Six, folks, uh, you've got to grab a hold of it. Off of our website, Hagman and ha or, uh, HomelandSecurityUS.com, is a link to Steve's website, uh, Genesis Six Giants. And uh, his website is genesis6giants.com. But, of course, that's accessible via stevequail.com. And one of the uh, one of my best best friends, uh, I consider him a brother, Steve Quail. Steve, welcome to tonight's program. Well, Doug and Joe, what a, what a pleasure it is to hit this subject head on because every day there are new reports breaking out all over the world of supernatural, preternatural events people seeing uh, signs in the sun, moon, and stars, uh, falling stars that are falling directly perpendicular to the earth. We're seeing people uh, talking on the Native American reservations of watching actual stargates opening up. And uh, I literally had a friend of mine who's doing some research for me, uh, God bless you, Mac, uh, talked to uh, uh, one of the Native elders down in the Four Corners region who actually took uh, a couple shots at a... Uh, Bigfoot, and we'll talk about Bigfoot a, a little different uh, later on in the show. But tonight, Doug, I want to explain where there's a lot of confusion now. Let me share this. I got my first introduction to this by revelation, and there's a difference by revelation. What I mean by that is it's like I think God in his mercy, he gives us two sets of scales. We obviously have the conscience, which is a set of scales in our heart, which we uh, measure what's right and what's wrong, and God's put the knowledge of him in all of our hearts. But the devil comes to be basically steal away the word and steal away uh, our ability to discern. And then the scale over our eyes, just as Saul of Tarsus was blinded when he saw Jesus in his glory and had to go and have Ananias lay hands on him that his sight might recover. Most Christians are blind to spiritual truths because, number one, the pastors don't know how to teach this stuff, most of the time they're ignorant, and there are exceptions to that rule, but 99% of the Christian church will not teach what I'm going to teach tonight. Now, before I even go into this stuff, I want people to understand, 20 years ago I was talking about this on talk radio. There were no people that were coming after me, forgive me, I'm talking uh, uh, scholars, there were a lot of people coming after me, but not in that realm. And now it seems like there's so many experts out there, and there is a confusion in terms. And I want to deal with three terms right off the bat, okay? Nephilim are the fallen angels. People can argue, but I'm going to give enough scripture. The Rephaim are the giants, okay? They are the children of the fallen angels and earth women. And then the demons are the disembodied spirits of the uh, giants, and also, Doug, we're going to get into the Book of Giants, which is one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
it's not scripture, but it's on the it's found in the same area as so many of the Dead Sea Scroll fragments of Isaiah and other books of the Bible were were uh, found. And we're going to talk about the lost books of Eden, and we're going to talk about how all these things can be. Because look, we're told to study our to study to show ourselves approved unto God workmen rightly dividing the truth and and what i tell everybody you've heard me say this probably for as long as you and i've known each other doug that take everything to the lord in prayer i even talked to a pastor tonight dear friend of mine he said steve we've known each other for 20 years but he said the other night in prayer the lord said it's time david for you to start looking into this because i'm going to give you revelation and he, he and i talked before i went on the show a couple hours ago and he said, now it's time, it's time. I said, that's because it's the days of Noah. So, Doug, we're going to open up with the, the most important part of Scripture. Now, here's, here's something that's fascinating to me. Most people will deny this, but they won't make the effort to go and search out the Scriptures. There are, and I'm going to deal with all the stupid stuff that's out there, too. And here's what the Word of God says, Genesis 6, 1 through 6. And it came to pass when, man, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that. Now, to the main point I want to get across right now is there were giants before the flood and after the flood. Goliath, King Og, uh, uh, Goliath's brothers, there were, there were so many tribes of giants, and those giants were called Rephaim, and we're going to get to the scriptures in that in a minute. Now listen to this, that when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, the same became the mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. So we've got Genesis 6, 1 through 6 talking about the initial onslaught where 200 angels came to Mount Hermon. And by the way, Doug, and I want everyone to know this, there is such a vast treasure trove of information on Genesis6Giants.com, the number 6, the numeral 6, that if you go to the ancient text, you can go and read this stuff for yourself. Now, I said earlier that demons are the disembodied spirits of the giants, but what most people don't understand is that the giants that were formed were not just uh, strictly uh, between the fallen angels and the earth women. Those giants also corrupted animals, and that's where bestiality came from, and that's where all the mythological beasts and all of the legends came from, and that perversion of what God basically forbade or forbid, and that was forbidden unto the cross mixing of species. That's what produced all that stuff, and it didn't matter. They even, they even, the the the, the fallen angels corrupted fish. It corrupted mammals. They corrupted insects. And so, when you see all these things, somebody said, "Could they have made dinosaurs?" Well, my answer to that is the corruption of of uh, what was taking place was certainly not reflected in, uh, uh, I would say this, a nice uh, presentation in history. You have absolutely total war. You have total war in the heavens, and it comes to earth, and now we're getting set for another war. So what I want to make clear again, three words that are different. There are people, and I think even Tom Horn and I got into it a little bit on your show the other night, the word Nephilim is the fallen ones. Those are the fallen angels. The Rephaim are the giants. And for instance, let me just go here right now. It, it, in Second Samuel 5:18, because I'm going to give eight scriptures, and, and I think people need to look this up. The Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of the Rephaim. In Strong's Concordance, just for those of you that want to look it up, 7497. And the Philistines came up yet again and spread themselves in the valley of the Rephaim. Now, and then uh, First Chronicles uh, chapter 11:15. Now, there of the thirty captains went down to the rock. To David in the cave of Adullam, and the host of the Philistines encamped in the valley of the Rephaim. And it goes on in Isaiah 17:5 to say, "And it shall be as the harvestman gathereth the corn and reapeth the ears with his arm, and it shall be as he gathereth ears in the valley of the Rephaim." So the valley of the Rephaim simply means the valley of the giants. The word Rapha, okay, is interesting because Rapha is R-A-P-H-A, and that word is translated dead. 
like D-E-A-D. So when you read in Job 26.5, dead things are formed from under the waters and the inhabitants thereof. That word dead isn't like dead earth people. It isn't dead human beings. It's literally talking about the Rephaim, and the Rapha is the root word for Rephaim, okay? Uh, Psalm 88.10, Wilt thou show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead, meaning Rephaim, arise and praise thee? Now, the answer to that is no, because we get to the book of Enoch, and I know I'm covering a lot in this introduction, but it's important for people to understand. Enoch was 365 years old when the Lord took him to heaven. It says simply in the scripture that he was not and that the Lord took him. But Enoch is one of the most enigmatic people in history, because even the Hebrew traditions teach that Enoch was taken to heaven, shown all the secrets, all the wonders of the universe, and told to put them into a books, books, plural, and bring them to the sons of men. Now, why people can't understand that history, as you open this whole show up, is a convoluted camouflage of the truth in order to deceive mankind so that when the Antichrist comes on the scene, it was so effective when he uh, showed up and was able to corrupt uh, humanity. Now, they don't have to do it sexually before the days of the flood and after the days of the flood. They're doing it genetically through genetic alteration, mutation, and that's what the whole alien, uh, and I'm not talking about illegal aliens, I'm talking about aliens, extra uh, dimensionals, I don't call them extraterrestrials, I call them extra dimensionals, are coming to do. They're coming to deceive the world. They're coming to do the same thing. And so much so that Jesus himself said that if the days were not shortened for the elect's sake, there would be no flesh left alive. When you read the writings of uh, some of the foremost geneticists, some of the foremost uh, molecular biologists, some of the most, uh, uh, I would say, uh, misanthropic scientists, meaning they hate mankind, they all basically said that we are a fluke, we're a mistake, meaning those of us who are creating the image and likeness of God, humanity, and that we need to be done away with. So in what we're talking about tonight, Doug, is the Rosetta Stone. This is the way to understand history. Years and years ago, almost 40 years ago, the Lord said, Steve, I want to teach you the roots of evil so you don't deal just strictly with the fruit of evil. If you only deal with the fruit of evil, you miss the root of evil. So basically, it's basic uh, God teaching me how to help his other kids. Now, let me share this, Doug. You can go out and find probably five guys that will disagree with me on that. But I simply say, where were they 40 years ago? Where were they 20 years ago? And again, what they're now getting, and so many people recycle my own stuff, and then they put their twist on it. I was just on the Internet and seeing uh, people taking their twist off of what I said, and I've not said what they've twisted me to say, but I want to go on record telling everybody that there's a difference. This is why demons seek to occupy and possess human beings. It's because the appetites they had before they were killed in whatever form they took basically are insatiable and that insatiable appetite drives them to express themselves so much so that when the gathering demoniac was uh, commanded to come out by jesus himself the demons begged jesus to let him go into the pigs and what did the pigs do they basically ran off the cl uh, cliff and committed suicide well right now we've got amazing amounts of scripture being fulfilled and uh, the point that's important for people to understand is that the Bible is God's truth. It's not, God can't, he can't give infinite truth to a finite uh, group of people. He can expand their understanding, and like he said to the angels, go and show Daniel. We have to be shown the stuff in the spirit realm. Because we have to have, there's many people will seek it through the occult, which means hidden realm. Many people will try and do anything they can to get power. But the Bible tells us the right way to approach God is to receive Jesus. And to as many as receive Jesus gives he, he gives the power to become the sons of God. Now that's the introduction. You want to ask any questions? Uh, wow. Uh, that's one heck of an introduction. I, I, you know, you know, I, I do want to ask one question, and and, and this is, uh, I, I'm not even sure I can phrase it properly. Let me try. I know that we're not talking about the Illuminati. I know that we're not talking about the chosen ones, but 
It's my understanding that uh, are, are, we, are we going to be talking about DNA today at all? Is, is this anything yeah? We're going to get to we're going to get to the issue that uh, a certain friend brought up because I think it's cr critical. Okay. Because all right. you know we are going to talk about DNA, and ladies and gentlemen, it's so critical that uh, if you can receive it. I think you'll understand the words of Jesus, and we'll we'll get to that, Doug. Okay. Okay. And when we get to that, uh, you know, after the break, I'll have you read it because it was initially uh, meant for you, and then you forwarded it to me, and the lights went on. Jesus said, "There's weeping and gnashing of teeth in hell, eternal separation from God, where their worm dieth not." And it's fascinating to me that what you received the other day was confirmation of this talk show tonight. So, ladies and gentlemen, and when I say this, this isn't just to titillate you with ancient history. This is to show you that as it was in the days of Noah, so it is now. As it was in the days of Lot, so it is now. And, and the judgment of Almighty God. I get Christians, Doug, that, and, and forgive me, I get professing or let's even use a different word, a strong word, supposed Christians telling me this stuff is unimportant. Well, they usually go to churches that deny the divinity of Jesus, they deny the blood of Jesus, they deny the virgin birth, they deny heaven, they deny hell, and by the time they're through denying everything, I said, why don't you just go out and declare yourself to be a, a, a carrot cake, or the first fellowship of the carrot cake or something, because to even use the word Christian is a, is a great disservice to the living God. And that's why, again, I quit using it, not because I'm denying it. I'm just saying that a, I am a blood-bought follower of Jesus. I am not ashamed of Jesus by the grace of God. I'm sorry I'm such a, uh, you know, when I say I'm sorry, I wish I could be a better example. Uh, you know, I know that I have failings as a human being, but one thing I refuse to do is sit back and allow the world to blaspheme the name of the Son of God, to ridicule the Son of God, to absolutely embrace the powers of darkness. And, and Doug, everything I said 20 years ago about beheading and cannibalism and all that stuff is coming into vogue, and it's because of the demon possessed individuals. It's because of a belief system that demons brought forth. And you probably saw it in New Jersey, what, a couple days ago, the, the, they were carrying the story of, of the guy that basically beheaded two Coptic Christians, Christians, and cut, what, their arms and legs off? So we're seeing now, we're seeing the full implementation of such violence that that's what, it was, that's what God's talking about. It re, he, he almost repented that he made man. But then by the grace of God, you can understand that redemption is, is in Jesus when the word of God says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. We're going to get into the DNA thing because when Jesus said to the Pharisees, and I got news for you, I got their, their great-grandchildren writing me and sending me emails every day, ye are of the father, the devil. That means more than philosophically. It means more than uh, uh, just ethereally or metaphorically. It is literally, a, Jesus is making a statement because, look, the, and most people don't know this, and again, it's on my website under ancient texts. Go read the book of Adam and Eve, especially the second volume, and see exactly how Satan uh, tried to tempt Adam. And, and you know, there, there's people don't understand that the Canaanites, uh, what most people would call the serpent seed, it's when the daughters of Cain and uh, the non-Adamic stock, in, in other words, understand this, the angels were out uh, fiddling, <laughs> how's that a good word, messing around with earth women, and the daughters that uh, were born under them carried a genetic marker, and that genetic marker is what we're going to talk about when we get to DNA. But let me read 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen through 15. It says, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. You know, again, this is a critical issue. In other words, we have transformers, not in the you know, sense of the word Autobots and, and that kind of stuff, but we have transformers. We have transforms. We basically have 
entities that are capable of taking on the shape of whatever they want. That's why I want to make it clear. The fallen angels were able to size themselves accordingly in order to impregnate earth women. It wasn't the giants necessarily, although in my book, Genesis 6 Giants, I literally cataloged the case of one of the uh, uh, Catholic uh, monks, if you will, or priests in 1564, 1584, literally going into a jungle community in South America and hearing the stories about how the giants, giants, G-I-A-N-T-S, uh, literally raped the women to death, and obviously you can understand uh, what happened to the women, and literally thunderbolts from heaven fell and slew the giants. So you can see how mythology with, with uh, Zeus's thunderbolts and all this stuff plays in. It's the truth of the world that every major civilization that I have cataloged, and I don't know if any I haven't, all owe their origins and their architecture to giants and their understanding of astronomy, their understanding of medicine, their understanding of sexuality. The point is, is that this is all attributed to the giants. When Adam and Eve uh, basically sinned, they both did. Uh, there, I get off the hook with the ladies. The thing is, is that they became susceptible to deception and seduction. And I want people, if they've got the nerve and have the prayer life to go and seek God on it, you need to go to my website, Genesis 6 Giants, and read the ancient text, because I'm going to read them on the air, not everything, because there's, you know, a thousand pages of stuff. But I think it's important that people understand that when Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light, that it is possible for, uh, uh, basically, fallen angel can take on the form of a man or a woman, and that's where in the Middle Ages and Dark Ages, the word incubus and succubus arrived. Basically, they called them demons in those days, but it was a far different cry from a demon. Uh, demons typically have to possess an already existent body where fallen angels can uh, transform themselves into either a male or female form or take on the form of animals. That's where the werewolf myths came and every other myth, and we're going to talk about maybe skinwalkers, uh, stargates, and portals. But see, this is all stuff that's in the Bible, believe it or not. For instance, those of you that don't get it about uh, the fallen angels having sex with animals, go look up the lion men of Moab. And, Doug, it's almost like God and his providence is allowing archaeological finds about you know, maybe a month ago, I put up a story on Genesis6Giants.com, go to the Giants News, and it said the oldest, uh, if you will, portrayal of any sculptor in the world has just been found, and it is a man's body with a lion's head. Any chance it could be the lion men of Moab? So, see, the thing is, is that the, it's, it's not only the truth is out there, but God's word declares that it's not that he doesn't tell us the truth, it's that we reject the truth, okay? We don't want to know it. Now, it's fascinating to me. I know Christians who say what I'm talking about is scary, yet they go and watch vampire movies and Twilight <laughs> series, and they go to werewolf movies, and they go to, uh, you know, the exorcist movies, or, uh, you know, everything that's wicked, that's profane, that's a, you know, a slasher uh, movies. They go to all that, and then they tell me what I'm telling them makes them scared so they don't want to have anything to do with it. Does that sound like someone's uh, deceived or seduced? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, how can – yeah, it's, it's, it's actually backwards, Steve. I mean, really. Come on. It's, yeah, you know, it's anyone who's afraid to approach this head on. And I'm just reminded by uh, how I felt, you know, several years ago, Steve, how – you and I, when 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 I when you and I first met, and you, we were talking, you were talking about giants, and I read your book, and uh, I was thinking, man, you know, butterfly net time for a lot of people. But but what you're saying is not only rooted in the scripture; it's actually being discussed at uh, some of the highest, I mean, levels within the intelligence community, well beyond I even knew existed. So, you're, yeah, you were ahead of your time not that you need my endorsement but i just want people to understand this is not uh, fruit loop stuff this is uh historical and biblically uh, uh concise and accurate so yeah you're right well i guess let's put that into perspective 
if if I could tell you that in all of the years that that the Lord has been faithful, the Lord Jesus Christ, I, I, there's no other Lord in my life except the Lord Jesus Christ. The bottom line is the people that he's brought across my path. I remember one smart aleck once said to me, he said, well, how are you going to go find the people that know this? My answer was simple. I'm not. The Lord will bring them to me. And uh Doug, you know, we're going to read parts of that letter, if you don't mind. We'll get to that in the last hour, yeah, because sure. I think it's critical, or, you know, maybe even before then. I'm really trying to walk with the Lord, is because I think what, uh, forgive me, I know that there are a lot of people who are praying, and Bruce and Susan, and God bless your entire congregation. I mean, John Kyle and Linda are praying, Pastor Langford's praying, Romy and Manette and Diana and Tracy. I mean, these are people I know by name, but I, I get emails every day now from people around the world saying, we're praying for you. And I don't think, Doug, you know, I, I, I forgive me, I would have never thought, Doug and Joe, that your show would basically be the staple that Christians and believers who are in some of the most remote parts of the earth listening to this show on satellite uplinks, etc., off the Internet, or downloading them, or people by uh, burst transmitting them in some cases, and if you understand what a burst transmitter is, you'll know that that's important to a lot of people, uh, especially in uh, military intelligence and the, uh, oh, good night, intelligence agencies. The thing is, is that we are now seeing people absolutely getting the lateness of the hour. It's not by the thousands at a time necessarily, but it is basically thousands by the week. And Doug, you know this, that even our numbers, when I say numbers, there are people that specifically want to knock the numbers down on blog talk radio, because at one point we were t coming up against, uh, what was it, some atheist show or something? <laughs> yeah, and, exactly. and we, Yeah, and we lost him in the, in the million download realm. But the point is, is that, ladies and gentlemen, you can't hide the truth. And so uh, Doug said something. I think it's critical. I believe it's absolutely a necessity for those of you to understand how civilization evolved. We didn't come out of pond scum. I categorically renounce, reject, and want to vomit the, the, you know, the theory of evolution. That was nothing more than Satan's contempt for the creation of mankind, and it will only be useful until he comes on the scene, reverses the whole evolutionary stance, and you're seeing it already. Water on Mars, remember when that was poo-pooed, you know? Uh, come on, uh, life on Europa or some of the different moons or some of the different planets, you know? How many habitable planets and billions of uh, solar systems, you know? Uh, the problem is, is that people simply and Christians have chosen mostly to, de to deny this stuff and to avoid it. But in denying and avoidance, they're robbing themselves of the root of truth. And when they rob themselves of the root of truth, they cannot expect the fruit of truth to be in their life. Because in one form or another, deception reigns. And so this is what I'm saying, simply this, ladies and gentlemen. Again, the last time I'll say this tonight, and then we'll go on with the interview, Doug. The Nephilim are the fallen angels. The Rephaim are the giants. The demons are the disembodied spirits of the giants who died and also of the hybrids that were produced when the giants went after even the fish. If you want to know where mermen and mermaids came from, somebody, I don't believe that stuff. Well, of course you don't believe it. But the bottom line is it's real. O-A-N-N-E-S. Go Google it if you think it's crazy. Because the bottom, the, and I'm going to just say the bottom line probably ad nauseum, and I'll try not to, but when you cut everything out, here it is. God's word is true. Jesus is the savior of the human race. That the enemy is absolutely in destroying the human race, tearing up mankind, getting mankind to do everything they can to infuriate God because he's holy, just, faithful, and true, and so that God will judge the wicked. But ladies and gentlemen, every time the sons of God is used, go look at the book of Job. It's not talking about you and I, Doug, are, are, are technically, sure, we're sons of God, but in the Old Testament sense, the sons of God were always angels. Now, that's why Jesus called himself the Son of Man. He was saying, I came to redeem the seed of Adam. 
but Noah and his family were the only ones that were uh, found to uh, be pure genetic stock. That doesn't mean they were morally pure. Anybody who knows the story about Noah, we're not talking about moral purity. We're talking about genetic. And that's why when you go through the genealogies in the Word of God, it used to drive me crazy trying to read all those names until the Lord spoke to me and said, Steve, the reason I did that is to show that there's no uh, genetic drift or any interference in who begot who. Well, that made it a lot more tolerable, okay? I still can't pronounce the names, but I get the, the idea. And so the thing is, is that what's fascinating to me is that now this is the time that this is opening up. By the way, Doug, 20 years ago, nobody talked about fallen angels. Nobody. 20 years ago, nobody talked about genetic manipulation. I did. So a man has nothing except to receive it from above. And, you know, I'm taking Jesus' stance. Look, if you don't believe that, believe this. If you can't believe this, then don't call yourself a believer. Because, again, most people are set in their ways, they're set in their doctrine, and they absolutely will perish because of the lack of knowledge. That's the word of God. You want to get mad at somebody? Then uh, I would say, don't get mad at God, because he's the one that said that. My people perish for the lack of knowledge. It doesn't say the pagans. It doesn't say the heathen. Jesus even commended that the children of the world deal more wisely with one another than the children of light. But that doesn't mean the children of the world are saved. Far from it. But the point is, is that we have to search the scriptures, and we have to be led by the Spirit of God, and we have to be empowered by the Spirit of God. There is nobody, 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 nobody who's going to be able to stand against what's already on the earth. I used to say years ago, coming upon the earth, I don't say that anymore, upon the earth now, that is going to manifest in such horrific, heinous, and wicked ways. And the letter you got uh, uh, this week, that would make you believe that, wouldn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah, Steve, yeah. And, and so, you know, we've been, we've been fed a staple diet of some of the most sinisterly wicked images. And some of these images that the, the Hollywood writers and stuff get, some of them, you know, I mean, in the days of uh, hallucinogens, you know, when LSD was just basically like popping an aspirin, and then obviously all the different drugs, the psychotropic drugs and everything, or the trances people would, put themselves in or ask for projection. I am not in favor of any of those, but I'm just saying the people that came up with the imagery, I believe, were given literal visions while out of their body, many of them, and they saw the stuff that's really out there. And that's why the people that have gone to hell and seen hell and the Lord has brought back have such horrific uh, 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 images that they've seen. It just defies the imagination. And I remember it was, I believe it was Dimitri Dudeman that was told by the angel of the Lord and other men of God and prophets who have been told that the mind of man cannot even embrace the level of wickedness and the level of uh, uh, mental trauma that's going to come upon the earth. And if it's uh, basically as bad as it's getting right now with food stamps and uh, iPods, I iPads and, uh, you know, uh, the potential for those being shut down, then it's pretty amazing. So I think the fact is, is that tonight we're going to talk about the Book of Giants. I'm going to read that after, you know, uh, after giving you some time to, to, to reciprocate. And by the way, I'm not trying to dominate, so you just inter, interrupt any time you want. It's just that I, I just told my wife uh, uh, you know, before I went on the show, I said, yeah, I said, I got an easy task. I could get 6,000 years of history and then the dateless past all in three hours. Yeah, yeah, uh, in, in the monologue uh, format, too, because you, you know what, Steve, I, I, you've got a perfect, a great cadence going, uh, I mean, you're, 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 and you've got so much knowledge, I don't, we, Joe and I don't want to interrupt, so you take it, uh, you've got the floor, uh, uh, but one thing that I just want to say while I have the opportunity here is this, uh, I would just wish everyone would pay attention and open your mind up because what I thought was really, like I said before, what I thought was just uh, uh, fiction and just fancy, you know, uh, just just things that were just so far out, you know, they're not. And, and and you've got to understand that this is real. And when you do understand, and, and, and by the way, by understanding it's real, there's also the point that you get to the point where, 
you understand that everything we've been told is a lie, or the majority of what we've been told by the people who are teaching us things, history, it's a lie. Uh, and, and it's that's a pretty big and bitter pill to swallow. So, um, you know, with that, just, just go ahead, Steve. You've got the floor, my friend. Well, I, again, I want everyone to go and look at uh, uh, my website, genesis6giants.com, and go to the ancient text, because I want people to understand where this uh, uh, all comes from. Now, this is called the Book of Giants. By the way, it's out of the Dead Sea Scrolls, okay? Most people don't recognize it. One other, the other thing I want to share, too, Doug, is Jesus said, Lo, I come in the volume of the books it is written of me. That's not just the law and the prophets, because Paul was trained under Gamaliel, okay? And he was the, if you will, he was one of the smartest guys uh, around. In other words, it would be like saying that, you know, you, you, you were the, uh, if you will, key student of the most brilliant man in the world at that time. So he was well-versed in the book of Enoch. He was well-versed in this stuff, meaning the Apostle Paul. So when he's talking about transforming into an angel of light, I can actually take you, and I will, we'll go there in a little while, to the forgotten books of Eden. Now, the thing is, is that what I'm saying is keep in context that I'm not saying any of this stuff is the canon of Scripture. But what I am saying is when Jesus quotes, or the New Testament quotes, or the Old Testament quotes from the book of Enoch or the book of Giants, then the bottom line is, is that you can understand that uh, you know, there's some credibility to it. Now, let, let me go to the book of Giants, okay? Uh, it, it, it's, it's an amazing, and we only have fragments of it, okay? And it, it's so telling that it absolutely boggles my mind, okay? And, and I used to think that was, that was almost impossible to do. Boy, did I get a lesson in supernatural reality really quick by the hands of some very well-placed uh, individuals who fight the stuff that goes bump in the dark. I'll never forget a certain general said to me, he said, yeah, I get to, me and my men, or he said, my men and I get to deal with the things that go bump in the night, but he said, we get to bump back. And I thought, what a great statement. What an amazing <laughs> statement. And that's who I termed over the years the mighty men and women of valor. Okay, here it is, the Book of Giants. Now, these are reconstructed texts. We don't have every single word, so I'm going to uh, uh, I'm going to read this and, and go to my website, Steve, or some, I'm sorry, Genesis6Giants.com. By the way, that's the website I hang out on a lot because I'm always adding to it, and pretty soon that'll be updated daily. I'm just trying to ask God to give me 48 hours and 24, and then I got a great pastor friend who said, Steve, he said, Bruce said, Steve, slow down. He said, God will give you more to say in the 80% if you'll just back off 20%. So, Doug, I'm trying to back off 20% tonight. I don't think I'm succeeding at this point. Okay, wow. this, this is the title, The Angels Exploit the Fruitfulness of the Earth. Everything that the earth produced, the great fish, the sky with all that grew, fruit of the earth, and all kinds of grain and all trees, beasts and reptiles, all creeping things for the earth, and they observed all, every harsh deed and utterance, male and female, among humans. Now the 200 angels choose animals on which to perform unnatural acts, including, obviously, humans. And now, the 200, that's talking about the 200 original fallen angels, okay? They went after the donkeys. They went after the asses. They went after the sheep. They went after the goats. They went after, uh, fr they went after every animal and every bird for misignation, well, obviously. So, in essence, what they did, the fallen angels being able to transform themselves were able to do it to the animals, and that's pretty disgusting, but I'm sorry, that's how it happened. The outcome of the demonic corruption was violence, perversion, and a broad base of monstrous beings. And they defiled, they begot giants and monsters. This is out of the Book of Giants, which is one of the Dead Sea Scrolls, okay? Do you think they're going to teach this stuff much in seminary? I doubt it. The guy that understood this better than any preacher was Gene Scott. And I, can under, I, can, I understand what happened to him. I still think he's one of the most brilliant men that ever lived. And I, I, I almost went the same route as he did, but the Lord intervened through intercessory prayer. I was getting to the point where I was getting so uh, torqued, let me use that word because it's less, uh, I guess, um, upsetting to some people, that I said, Lord, what's the use? 
all your people do is gripe and complain, and I said, at you and then at me, and they don't want to know the truth, so why tell them the truth? And that's why, you know, it, it, that's what takes a lot of people down. But unfortunately, intercession got me through the bitter phase, and now I'm working on the better phase. But it's by the grace of God. And so I, this is the time I say to the intercessors and everyone who's ever said a prayer for me, may the Lord God of heaven multiply that grace that you've shown me a thousandfold back in your life. And I believe in big numbers. I don't deal in little numbers, okay? So the point is, is that here's what it says. The outcome of the demonic corruption was violence, perversion, and a brood of monstrous beings. Now listen to this. Ah, uh, this is this is pretty amazing. They begot and behold, all the earth was corrupted, and that means sexually corrupted. It means no offense, but they. Uh, how do I say this? They sexually assaulted everything and anything. Why was that? Because this was a direct a defilement of God's barriers. Remember the Lord says, after its kind, and he saw that it is good? The whole book of Genesis is the most wonderful, splendid, uh, I would say this, love letter to creation by the king of glory who created us all, okay? Now, most people can't say that. Now, it says this, from the angels upon, in the end it will perish and die. They cause great corruption in the earth. The giants begin to be troubled by a series of dreams and vision. Mahweh, the titan, son of the angel Barakiel, reports the first of these dreams to his fellow giants. He sees a tablet being immersed in water. When it emerges, all but three names have been washed away. The dream evidently symbolizes the destruction of all but Noah and his sons by flood. Now, the book of Giants is so amazingly old, okay? But when it was put into the Dead Sea Scrolls, somebody in the uh, Essene, E-S-S-E-N-E, uh, community had to have copied it from a previous text. So, so understand the men who have access to this stuff, the 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 the, the Illuminas who are what I would call uh, the the ones who have their DNA entangled by a serpentine filament, and you can explain that, Doug, or read it. We get there. The this is this is uh, this is what the word of the scrolls is stating and this is where all 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 of the different myths and legends in greek mythology and roman mythology in and basically persian mythology all of this stuff comes from fallen angels okay now i want to make it clear not all fallen angels had sex with earth women and animals there were a special group of those but after the flood they came a second time and it was, seems like, you know, some people say, well, I thought everything on earth was drowned. Well, that's true, but there, there are so many ancient texts of the uh, fallen angels, you know, basically almost getting their wings clipped, so to speak, and having to revert to technology. This is especially true in the Vedas, or V-E-D-A-S, of the Indian Sanskrit, of that basically talks about Vimanas, V-I-M-A-N-A. -A. I'm spelling it so people can go look it up. The, the spaceship. So whether they went off planet or went underground, went underwater, in whatever. Remember, these entities produced, before they fell, supernatural intelligence. They had abilities and skills to basically create the things that ancient technology produced. And again, as different people in the military and intelligence community have told me, the whole search for uh, artifacts is basically for the weapons of war, you'll find this interesting, and for the control and dissemination of information that A can use against B, B can use against C, or C can use against D. It's like the great pyramids in China. And most people don't understand that the pyramids in China surpass that of the Giza Plateau by levels of magnitude or the, the pyramids that are in the Great Lakes, or the pyramids that are all over the world, whether they're in the Antarctic or the Arctic. The point is, is that there's a whole lot of history out there that men have chosen to uh, try and obliterate so that men and women can never know the core truth. They can never come to the understanding of what's real. In other words, we're, we're not in a, uh, just a matrix alone. We're in an illusionary, demonic, presentation and a very sinisterly wicked control of the truth in order that he be Satan and his fallen angels and all of their ilk, those who surrender to them, might basically totally deceive 
the whole world and not only deceive but ultimately destroy it. Mm. So everything we're talking about tonight, Steve, has as a uh, uh, well. I mean, it's important for it's important for us to understand this in order to understand not only how uh, I'll say how, how how our enemies here think. When I say our enemies, I'm talking about the Luciferians that we reference and even the Illuminati that we reference, but this is for all of the marvels. This is for our eternal salvation. Understanding this helps us put things in perspective. And I mean, this is how I look at it. Is that a fair statement? Well, I, I, yeah, and see, this is something that's interesting. Remember the Illuminati. To illuminate means to show light on, and to them, the light is Lucifer. I guess this would be a good time to go to that um, uh, part in what, you know, do you want to go there now? Because I think it's important. Yeah, it's your call, my friend. I've, I've got okay, it yeah, um, let me just go there, Doug. What we're going to read to you is a certain part of a, of a um, just let's say this, an amazing, amazing revelation to Doug. And at this point, neither he nor I have put it up, although we both may put it up. I, who was it that turned you down that didn't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole? Uh, but, but, yeah, I'd rather not say, but I got to tell okay, you this. Okay, but, yeah, but, but, okay, yeah, okay, I got you. I do have, I do have, by the way, just so you know, a final revised uh, edition of that. So just let me know okay. if you want to. Well, but uh, let's do this, change, then, Doug. It doesn't change what? anything. In, it doesn't change anything, Steve, in in the uh, body of what you're gonna what you're gonna read. It's just uh, grammatically correct. That's all. Okay, right. Let me just go there right now. Okay. And I wasn't sure when we were uh, going to go there. Let's see. And, and uh, by introduction, folks, uh, just so that Yeah, you go ahead and introduce it. That will give me a couple minutes to find it. I'm sorry. Okay. I just clicked off. Oh, no problem. Um, it, it, ladies and gentlemen, here's the situation. Uh, I have known uh, an intelligence source, and I'm, I'm talking about a pretty high-level intelligence source. I've never referenced publicly this, this individual ever, um, but uh, he is... He he's in high. Look, he, he's high. Be, in be careful, Doug, on how much you give out, too. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That, just very, say that. That's enough. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, he he uh, he conveyed to me an incident, and this uh, what Steve has is uh, what he, what the incident he describes. And when I read it, uh, and for the first time I read it, I I, I had I, I was. It was kind of in the dark. I didn't know where things were going. And then, then I read it again, and then I understood, wait a minute, I understand what he's talking about. I know now that uh, the very things that Steve has been talking about all these years, he is con not only confirming from an intelligence position, but he is he's actually, um, well, he's confirming it, but also kind of explaining how things are operating today and and, and what why i suppose what really gets me is the fact that um a lot of christians and and as i see it and i could be wrong and, and steve is welcome to correct me but in, in, in the end times when we're looking for uh this big ugly antichrist to be on the scene we're actually going to uh, that antichrist to me uh as i understand it is going to be more of a benevolent type of figure that is going to essentially say well you know what uh the the bloodline of christ uh, you, there are people here in fact one person on the earth that has this bloodline of christ and look we can prove it by showing you the dna and, and in other words, uh, the, the, the Christ that you're looking for, the Messiah that you're looking for, is actually a man that's, that's among you today. And, and, and it's all a lie. I, I don't understand how kind of choppy that, that is, but that's how my um, small and limited intelligence about this very large topic can explain it to you. In other words, it, it's a great deception, but it's based on, or will be based on, the DNA. You know, today, CSI, it, it's all about DNA. It's all about, uh, well, did, did they do it? Did, didn't they do it? Well, you know, you got people in jail. Let's do a DNA test. Well, what, what, what would people say if somebody came to you and said, look, we've got the DNA of, of Jesus Christ from, I don't know, maybe the Shroud of Turin, Turin or some other artifact from that, that time. We, we know what Jesus' Jesus' DNA was. 
Now, now, now look, here is Mr. So-and-so. Look at his DNA and compare it to the artifact of, of, of Jesus. Now, uh, so there... We, he walks. To, he walks amongst us, and then, of course, you know, the spirit of the Antichrist fills that uh, bodily vessel. But it's all based on the DNA. Uh, something that uh, that again, I said, Steve. But but that's kind of it, 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 the, that's that's kind of how a, the deception is going to be. So when people talk about bloodlines and people talk about DNA and people talk about the Antichrist and people talk about all of this, and Steve talks about this, why is it important? Why are we even talking about it? Well, because this is part of the deception. And, you know, I, I don't know how else to explain it, but in, in my limited capacity about these issues, and I'm a linear thinker from an you know, investigator for 30 years, I'm kind of set in my ways. To see it in that light, to say, okay, you know, how, in other words, how can the, how can even the very elect be deceived by showing by somebody showing you scientific evidence or evidence that appears to be rooted in scientific fact when in fact it's nothing but a huge lie? That's how people can get, you know, it's kind of like this. And one last thing, Steve, it's kind of like this. Let's say I had a, a, a videotape of someone's wife. Uh, having you know improper relations with another person, and I say, you know what, your wife is a you know philanderer or whatever. I could use a different word, but I won't. And you say, I'm, I don't believe it. And, and I say, here, look at the evidence. And and you look at the evidence, and it's it's so hard to accept, and it's so repulsive. You don't want to believe it. That's kind of like you know that's where I was. I don't want to believe it. And the other side to that too is. The manipulation of that video, you know, I could, I could maybe have manipulated the video to, to make it look like it was. Uh, so, so there was deception at every turn. And and Steve, I'm sure, could do a lot better explanation than I just did. But but you kind of get where I'm coming from, I think, I hope. Well, I think it's really important. Now, Doug, I'm... Uh I'm uh, this it, it, lay it out a little bit because this was this came out of a murder investigation, okay? And we probably better be kind of careful on who we talk about because again, uh, I'm always conscious of uh, not giving. And for the record, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know who this is. I don't want to know who this is. But it's fascinating to me that what he's saying. Let me just read this from uh, Follow the Blood Trail, okay? Okay. It, listen to this. Under new heading, follow the blood trail. At first he noted the DNA strands he was examining seemed to be wound more tightly than normal. You see there are normally ten rungs per complete twist of the double helix strand in normal human DNA. In his analysis of our subject's DNA taken from his blood samples, he found intermittent sections which appeared to be wound more tightly with only nine rungs per complete twist, nine being an unusual and noteworthy number always turning and returning to itself. I thought to myself, that doesn't seem to be that unusual. Everybody I know seems like they're wound too tight. By the way, that's maybe where that came from. Simultaneously observed and documented that he at first believed to be the foretold third strand of the subject's DNA. There are a lot of people writing about the third strand of the DNA, but listen to this. Now, these are guys that know what they're doing. Upon closer analysis, he came to an entirely different and unexpected conclusion. Our subject had been lied to. It wasn't a third strand at all. It was a semi-transparent, elongated, serpentine-like parasite of infinitesimally small proportion. He gazed at it and studied it and shocked his belief and asked to himself, is this the prophetic little blood-sucking worm, the tyrannical destroyer of so many lives and worlds? My investigator friend continued, I remembered the false Cheshire grin surrounding a mouthful of fake pearly whites staring me down from his star chamber seat. Now, ladies and gentlemen, these are really prominent people in the world. I won't name him, but I know one of these people. I don't know him personally, but I know who he is. And waiting for my answer from behind the concealing screen, which provides me only partial anonymity, you see, he thought he'd caught me in a lie with what I had told his in his house investigator, but his investigator's authorizations and clearances were not the same as the senator's. As I replied, as you know, Senator, the lie is different at every level, and so it was, and so it always shall be, in this life anyway, from the highest thrones of this world to the tiniest strands of DNA. It's lies, 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 all the way down. Now listen to this. 
My friend tried and was trying at the time of his death to determine if there was any way to separate the writhing and gripping entanglements of the demon seed form from the host DNA without destroying the host. He also speculated on possible ways to identify the reptilian host who, excuse me, who walk amongst us and are living in the grip of the reptilian seed's alien possession. It was here I began my work, picking up where my friend had too abruptly left off. Deep in my thoughts, my friend said, I reached into the box of chocolates beside me. Interesting thing, he noted. They put some chocolate-covered jellies with red-colored sprinkles on top into the box of chocolates. But I reached instead for the three pastel-colored hard-shell candy at the center of the box. I didn't remember, I'm sorry, I did remember clearly that as I closed my eyes, just as I began to feel dizzy, and only a moment before I felt myself began to spin over the edge and down in the rabbit's hole. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, he had a box of chocolates. Someone put something in him in those chakras, and he was into what's called the rabbit hole. And as I was told uh, to pray before uh, before going into the rabbit hole, those of you in the uh, that part of uh, the world will understand what I'm saying. They said you better pray, Steve, because once you look into the abyss, the abyss stares back at you. I won't go into any more detail on my personal experience, but I will say this. All I can say is there are no words I possess, no emotions that can express, no thought patterns I can convey to the absolute horror that I beheld. There's just no words. I can't even say it. And I was told that would be the case. And I was told, look, this is a, I believe it's word for word. We are some of the toughest, most dangerous men in the world. We do things that most people can't even believe and would never understand. That's why our existence is pretty much, we're, we're, we're gone. There's no records of us. But he did say this. He said, grown men who are the toughest men in the world have literally had their hearts fail after embracing this stuff. Grown men who are young enough to basically be some of the premier fighters have turned gray in an instant. Others have absolutely gone mad. So that we're talking about hardcore battle uh, trained uh, ultra ultra black special operations guys. Okay. So Doug, what I'm saying in all this now we're going to get into the DNA. The idea is is that Satan initially tried to use fallen angels both before the flood and after the flood. The point that you can look into history, you'll always see the aliens. You can go to the Bayou Tapestry in the Battle of Hastings, I believe, 1066, and see literally a spaceship in one of the greatest tapestries that's ever been uh, uh, woven. And you can see uh, the cave drawings in Altamira. You can see the uh, cave uh, petroglyphs in, in Lascaux, France. You can go to the desert southwest. You can go to any place in the world, and you will see alien-sized giants with even spaceship uh, in the background. And these, some of these things predate 6,000 years. Well, how can you have something that predates 6,000 years? Let me make it clear. Adam and Eve were created 6,000 years ago, but prior to Adam and Eve's creation, there was a whole world. It was called the pre-Adamic Earth. There are people who dispute that, but the point being is in uh, Genesis 1-1, uh, you know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Those words tohu and bohu are without form and void, those are words only used in judgment. And when God basically blesses the earth and blesses the recreation, he uses a word, replenish. Replenish is a different word than that you would use if it's total uh, uh, creation, ex nihilo in Latin, out of nothing. So it, you go to the book of Isaiah, and the Bible literally says that God originally did not create the earth. That would be in the pre-Adamic earth, tohu and bohu. And guys like Arthur Custance and Derek Prince said, but the earth became void, uh, became void and without form. In other words, it was an act of judgment. You can go to Jeremiah chapter 4, I believe it is, and you can see that there's a flood that wipes out uh, judgment upon the earth before there was any Adam, man, or Adama, man, and before there were any cities. Well, how can you have entities being destroyed by a flood before? So there are really two floods, the pre-Adamic flood and then the post-Adamic flood. 
And now we've got a situation. By the way, if you haven't seen my photo of the day on stevequail.com, I'd encourage you to go see it. Probably one of the most intense rainbows I've ever photographed. But I put a caption dug up on the photo of the day saying that with all the chemtrail spraying and geoengineering, the, they're literally changing the waveforms and the transforms of visible light. And one of the biggest stories this week is now they're, they're, they're going to, you're going to love this, insert DNA or transform uh, the DNA of soldiers so they can sense uh, the infrared spectrum and see in the infrared spectrum, just like the snakes do, just like the serpents do, and just like Tom Horn was breaking the news. I don't think people grasp the, the gravity of what Tom Horn said, that when he said two dozen of the Vatican's leading acad academ like academics and also uh, ast astronomers and some of their brightest people basically said, guess what? The saviors coming back are lizard-like. It's just like the old Series V or the new Series V, as in victory. But this time, it's going to be very, very deadly. Do we need to take a break? Ah, good call, Steve. Thanks for watching <laughs> the clock for me. Uh, folks, you're listening to the Hagman and Hagman Report. This is a very special broadcast, the 20th day of February 2013. We're going to be right back after about three and a half minutes. Folks, stay with us. We're very pleased to have with us uh, Mr. Steve Quayle, stevequayle.com, and, uh, of course, his new site, uh, genesis6giants.com. Did I say that right, uh, Steve? Yeah, you did, Doug, and I'd like everyone to go there tonight and see the six-talent paw print that was in a recent newspaper uh, just in the last couple days that someone found on their window, and it's not a bear claw. It's not anything earthly that you could even... Uh, a tribute to any known beast. Now, why this is critical to what we're going to talk about tonight is in going into our two, everyone's paradigm of science is going to change, and the history of mankind is going to be so abruptly distorted by the revelation of the alien uh, disclosure, which Tom Horn and Chris Putnam were talking about, <clears throat> that I've uh, written about in my book, Aliens of Fallen Angels. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, again, the book Aliens and Fallen Angels really helps the average Christian pastor or elders to understand the whole, if you will, overview from a very linear, and that was an amazing feat of, by the grace of God, a linear fashion where they can follow the whole thing and not give people stupid answers when they come literally looking for the truth. For instance, someone who is seeing flying saucers or seeing unidentified flying objects or has basically seen uh, the things that go bump in the night, there are answers for those people. Obviously, God is so um, much in love with his creation, those who are redeemed, who have accepted his pardon through the blood of Jesus, that he gives us such amazing revelation Yet people would just as soon, quote, stay in the dark, pun intended, as to come into the light and see that there is a victory. You know, but Doug, one of the things that's lost on uh, modern-day Christendom is the word overcomers. Jesus specifically talks about those being given crowns who overcome. And Revelation, the book of Revelation, talks about we overcome uh, the power of hell by the, the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, and we love not our lives unto death. The point is, is that the devil holds most men and all mankind pretty much in a form of uh, fearful bondage, especially about death. But the fact is, Jesus, excuse me, didn't say it that the resurrection was a process. He said he is the resurrection, the truth, the way, and the life. So the point is, is that we're going to talk about stuff tonight that I really wanted to get to last night. So everybody that's, uh, you know, flying around ready to zap us, you can relax. Nothing's going to go out tonight that uh, outside of maybe you guys learning something. And I think we all know who I'm talking to. Now, uh, what, I, what I want to go into is when I started talking, Doug, uh, years ago and writing Genetic Armageddon and Aliens and Fallen Angels, most people simply cannot and could not at that point embrace the fact that yesterday's mythological monsters and legends were far from being just somebody who basically went back in a time machine who was a uh, writer of science fiction for Hollywood and just made all this stuff up. There are so many eyewitness accounts, and I've spent 40 years of my life running down, tracking down, interviewing, and digging through so much uh, stuff 
that sometimes it can be a little bewildering. But what I've asked the Lord to do is help me to explain and to use the topical matters that he brings, the historic matters that he brings, the spiritual revelation he brings, and then the eyewitnesses. For instance, tonight I'd like to get into the, the story that I covered just briefly, I think, when Tom and I were on your show together a couple of weeks ago wanted adventurous woman to give birth to Neanderthal man. Harvard professor seeks mother for cloned cave baby. Well, first of all, there's been a history of Neanderthals uh, in especially modern anthropology, and I'll talk about two words, uh, modern anthropology versus revised anthropology, that Neanderthals were in, if you will, the human genome as it evolved, which was only proven to be a total lie. And I'm here to tell you that all of evolution is a total lie. And the thing is, is that the people who are even creationists will I have to at some point come to the realization and actualization that the things that antiquity in recorded in the Bible and some of the pseudepigraphal works of, uh, and the, for instance, the Epic of Gilgamesh. And ladies and gentlemen, the Epic of Gilgamesh is the oldest known poetic narrative of fallen angels and uh, demigods, uh, half angels, half men, and the monsters that Gilgamesh basically conquered. And it's from 12 tablets from Uruk, U-R-U-K, or some people pronounce it Uruk. The point is, is that, and happens to be in Babylon, which happens to be in Iraq, therefore you get the word Uruk or Uruk versus modern day Iraq. But the point that's interesting, Doug, is the Epic of Gilgamesh was basically only thought to be fantasy until about, I think, 15 years ago, the BBC carried this story, the British Broadcasting Corporation carried this story, that Gilgamesh's tomb had been uncovered. And I can tell you from, again, eyewitness testimony to me, given by a very high-ranking uh, background source military, and his men and the women that work for him, they secure this stuff. The bottom line is Gilgamesh is not just a fictional character. He was a real entity, just as Nimrod was, just as some of the giant pictures you see on my website, genesis6giants.com. When you get uh, sarcophaguses that are anyway uh, are stone coffins that can be anywhere from 13 to 18 feet long, and the placement of those coffins throughout the world and the eyewitness testimony going along with it, the point that most people don't understand yet is that the truth of history has been kept from the people who inhabit history to control them. And that's why when we started talking about, you know, a certain subject matter last night about the bloodlines, etc., you know, somebody sent a message saying, don't go there. Well, just for the record, I think Hawk went there in his, its entirety on his show, uh, you know, an hour or so ago. So it's up on my website under Q Alerts. I'd encourage you to read that because, again, it's important for people to understand that you really have two seeds. From the book of Genesis, you have God's seed and you have the serpent seed, and they're going to be at war. There's going to be enmity, and as much as Christians want to placate and lay down and have a group hug and sing Kumbaya, and strum around a fireplace with, uh, you know, their their uh, combination idolatry, meaning they think somehow that you can uh, drink the cup of devils and drink the cup of the Lord. And Paul says in Corinthians, you can't do that. That's what's happening now in modern day Christendom. So what I'm trying to get un people to understand is that there is a history out there, and just as Daniel the prophet was told by the angel of the Lord, Michael, to, to seal up the prophecies yet for the appointed time, and the information that knowledge would explode, yet there was a time seal, there was a sequence of events, it was a process that had to take place before all these things would be revealed. I find it more than interesting that having... Uh, I would say this, led the foray, F-O-R-A-Y, into these subject matters long before most people even would acknowledge them because they were concerned with politically being, and actually uh, many of them told me this, well, I'd like to talk about what you talked about, Steve, but it would hurt our, our, our uh, financial base. I said, well, you might be surprised. There might be more people that would be willing to support you if you tell the truth instead of some of the stuff you think you're feeding the sheep and all you're doing is preparing them for slaughter. And I won't give names, but I'm talking about some pretty well-known ministries. So the thing is, is that we're now in a 
time period, Doug, unlike any other. And again, I don't know any better way to say it than Jesus said it. And he has indelibly printed this, imprinted it in my spirit, literally, that not only just as in the days of Noah, so shall the days prior to the coming of the Son of Man be, but the thing is, is that we're going to live in a time unlike any other in history, because we have the knowledge of salvation. Those of us who have been born from the birth of Jesus forward have the ability to either say yes or no to God's uh, answer to mankind's sin. Now again, hell was not prepared initially for mankind. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. It's interesting, just a little word of aside, kind of a revelation in the last six months, and I don't know if I've ever said this on your show. If I have, it needs to be restated, is that it's the scripture talks about God's angels being ministers of fire. It talks about the angel of the Lord as coming so many times. And even in the book of Acts, where, where God baptizes the, the uh, first century Christians and the Holy Spirit with cloven tongues of fire, it's interesting that the hell was basically is, is a plasma furnace, if you want, and the angels were made out of the fire versus us being made out of the dirt. And, and basically, when, when the Word of God says ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and that when you go to the first chapter of, of uh, Genesis and you start to see the creative process all the way through to the forming of man, it's interesting to note that we go back to dust, but when we're redeemed, that the soul, if you will, the spirit, not soul, the spirit of the righteous goeth up, but the soul of the wicked goeth down. And that has to do with gravity. And I mean, there's no way to contain that temperature known to mankind except in a plasma furnace. And guess what? It takes magnetism to contain that superheated, uh, uh, if you will, the fires or the plasma of hell. Isn't that kind of an interesting thing? So the word of God is, is so sharp. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And so what we're trying to do tonight is cut through a lot of the fluff where most people wouldn't believe that there's more evidence confirming the stuff that we're talking about than there is against it. Just because somebody will get on the boards and he's a shill for some cyber warrior command in, uh, you know, NORTHCOM or CENTCOM or, you know, DIA, Defense Intelligence or whoever, the bottom line is, is that what they all count on is they use a statement by, I believe it was uh, Goering, the head of Hitler's Luftwaffe, or one of the two, either him or Goebbels, uh, that made the statement, it's a good thing for us that people don't think. And so what I'm trying to do tonight is get people to think and be provoked to searching out the scriptures. And everything that I do, Doug, in research is based on the book of Genesis. That's how God launched me. And for those of you that want to have an amazing scriptural foundation and understanding, I would encourage you to go to DerekPrince.org. Derek has gone to be with the Lord, but he has a spiritual conflict series. Derek Prince, D-E-R-E-K, Prince.org, and he's got a spiritual conflict series that is so mind-boggling and mind-blowing, and, and you can't argue with his credentials. Oxford trained uh, not only theologian, but he was trained in uh, Greek and Hebrew and Latin, and uh, it's pretty tough to find somebody that has that kind of training anymore, especially in the youth, because again, the thing that's fascinating is the men of God who can uh, actually strove for the faith, the prices they paid to bring us what we have, and then the, I can't say that well, that way, the pathetic and poor way we've handled the truth as a nation that has been blessed beyond all, and as a, as a if you will, a fellowship of believers, I'll use that word, that are supposedly having God's great redemption in common, we have abdicated our position, we have become apathetic, indifferent, and we basically no longer know what it means to contend for the faith. Having said that, I'm encouraged, Doug, when I got an email from a single dad, he tells me his 11-year-old and 14-year-old sons listen to every word 
that's spoken, and they they absolutely get this. I have I have some friends. I have a, 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 some kids that listen to this show that are as bright as the children can be, and their parents, God bless them, have taught their kids what's coming down. And these kids are not fearful. Man, some of them are ready to go out and take on dragons, and I'm telling you, they're walking the faith to do that. Having said that, tonight I want to give a historic overview of of the things that most people don't realize are not the imaginations or a peyote high or some mushroom high from a bunch of natives in the jungles. You're talking about kings and kingdoms. You're talking about every major kingdom and every major ethnic world group uh, that has had encounters with things that we would call our supernatural monsters or demons or uh, devils. You name it, they've had encounters with them. And so, as I was researching, and by the way, in the in my new book called True Legends, okay, I and I don't have the subtitle yet worked out. I may have a, a native. I may change it to, to Native American Tales from the Land of the Plume Serpent. Just so you know, South America and North America, the even the word America means Land of the Plume Serpent. If you go to Aztec mythology, Quetzalcoatl. If you go to uh, Mayan. Uh, history, uh, Viracocha. In other words, when you go to all the pyramids, those who are pyramid builders, you go to the mounds, the serpent mounds. You can't get away from the serpent mounds. And just if you want something that will make uh, the the alert that I posted that Hawk read and that Doug and I were talking about last night when uh, you know his uh, phone lines and computer lines and everything was attacked, just type in serpent mounds because the word serpent is as old a word as I can find in the world of uh, derivations and uh, the beginning of all words. In other words, when you go to the root word or you go to the root language, when you come up with the specific etymological uh, usage of a word and start to investigate it, it's amazing because, and I, I'm going to go for a pun here, it's as old as a serpent in the Garden of Eden. That's where the word serpent even came into being. When you get into the Old Testament, you're talking about the book of Job, which is the oldest book in the Old Testament, and Job is talking about Behemoth and Leviathan, and God is putting questions to Job that obviously Job could not answer because only God himself knew the answers to some of the questions. I, I often said, if the Lord ever put me in that position, I just, I'd just chicken out immediately, Doug, and say, Lord, you know the answer to that question. I don't unless you reveal it to me, you know? And obviously God was speaking rhetorically to Job, but tonight we want to speak literally and, and cover the things that are really important for people to understand. Because, again, when you're talking about Bigfoot and you're talking about some of the, the around the world, by the way, Bigfoot has so many different names. There's over 200 different names for Bigfoot in the United States of America going back at least uh, 1,100 years just in the uh, North American, if you will, fol folklore. And the Native American tales of uh, encounters even in the last several weeks that I'm getting are overwhelming. I will be incorporating a lot of eyewitness testimony. And this isn't the flaky stuff you see on TV. This is guys who are living in some of the most, if you will, uh, geomagnetically charged areas of the world. And, and for those of you that are unfamiliar with ley lines, you need to look it up, L-E-Y, L-I-N-E-S, and I'm not going to go into it tonight, but it seems like where the Bigfoot appears or may disappear through whatever portals, you, when you start to uh, chart the encounters with some of these things, or not only the encounters, meaning the eyewitness testimony. For instance, most people would not realize that there are dozens and dozens of actual accounts in Pacific uh, Northwest newspapers of uh, everybody from miners to railroad engineers and railroad workers running into Big Feet and killing them. There also is no Harry and the Henderson history of Big Feet. You go into the Algonquin and Iroquois Indians and their legends. I mean, these, these things are cannibals. So tonight I want to kind of get into it because uh, I'm going to quote a lady named Mira Shackley. The wild man in various manifestations forms a part of the culture and mythology of almost every society since records began. Now, for those of you that have never read the Epic of Gilgamesh, if you will read the Epic of Gilgamesh, it's on my website, genesis6giants.com, 
the front page will come up and then you'll see the nav bar above the front page where the hot headlines are. And before you go to the update of Gilgamesh, go look at that six clawed uh, paw and tell me that doesn't give you a sense because it's right out of a newspaper again within the last uh, several weeks. So, you know, the Epic of Gilgamesh will give you an understanding. Now, Gilgamesh was what we would call from last night's pre interrupted time period, Doug. Uh, Gilgamesh would be considered a Rephaim. He was a giant. He was the, uh, if you will, the progeny of angels and earth women. And he was a king and a mighty king. And he was a uh, if you will, he was a larger-than-life figure because he was larger than life. And what's important for people to understand is no matter how big you think Adam and Eve might have been, so there are people that want to claim Adam and Eve were 12 and 9 feet tall. In all of my studies over four decades, I guess I'm starting now into the fifth, there has never been anything to suggest that because as, as Joe read the other night, when Joshua and Caleb went into the promised land uh, and they brought back the report, they were the only two that brought back a, a, a good report. All the rest of the guys said, we're not going in there because the land is filled with giants and it devours its inhabitants. Uh, it may be flowing milk and honey, but it's also flowing with uh, you know, uh, entities that eat little people. So the, the thing that's fascinating to me is that now there's a movie coming out, and I'm jumping around a little bit, and I'm going to stick with Bigfoot and get back to it. But Jack the Giant Killer, for most people, they would be hard-pressed unless they've read my stuff and listened to me over these years on Coast to Coast to even put it together. For instance, the city of London, which is known as a city within a city, it has two giants that founded it. And guess what their names were? Gog and Magog, okay? Interesting, huh? Now, we all know the word Gog and Magog from Ezekiel 36, but most people cannot reference the fact that Gog and Magog, and they're the patron saints. Once a year, they have a parade in the city of London. The city of London is like the Vatican. It has its own rules. And while it's technically in the British Isles, it is, uh, you know, what somebody said, the financial center of the universe, they attribute their origin to two giants, Gog and Magog. You can go and look it up on Wikipedia. Getting back to Bigfoot now, why is this critical? I, it is my contention, Doug, that now we're seeing so many, if you will, legendary beasts, legendary monsters. We're seeing the demons. We're seeing the devils. We're seeing all different manifestations of evil that God in his mercy had held back and kept back, whether he bound them in everlasting chains or they will go into everlasting chains, the point is, is that those things are being released by men who once were given dominion by the living God who have turned, if you will, to the dark side and now serve Lucifer. And that's what basically your, uh, you know, your, the, the thing that we were talking about last night that we were talking about on the air, that's what got somebody pretty nervous, okay? So... When I go through, and I can't even pronounce all of these, but I'm going to give you probably the top 50 names for Bigfoot from the top 50 tribes of Native American tribes. This is pretty interesting, okay? Because the Tashimian Indians, are, they call them just simply the cannibal. The Zunis knew the Bigfoot as a cannibal demon. Uh, the Balakula Indians called him the Bushman. And uh, the... It's fascinating to me that the Kwakawa, and that's really doing them no great service, but the wild men of the woods. The Dakota Sioux called them their big elder brother. The Lakota Sioux called them their big elder brother. The Wenatchee Indians called them the night people. It's interesting, the Seminole Indians called them the tall man. The Iroquois and the Seneca Indians called them the stone giants. The Iroquois called them, I'm sorry, they called them the stone giants or the stone coats. And what's fascinating, they, they, they have such inter interesting, the Quinault, Q-U-I-N-A-U-L-T -I -I Indians called them the dangerous being. The Plains Indians called them the tricksters. The Cherokee called them the hairy savage. The, the uh, T-L-I-N-G-I-T, Tlingit Indians called them the otter man. The Hari Indians called them the Bushman. The Karok Indians called them the Giant. The Menominee Indians called them the Giants. 
And listen to this. This is really interesting. Interesting. The Lenny Lanage Indians call them the mask being. Uh, the, they also call them the living solid face. So you go on, you go on, you go on. The tree men, or men who are as tall as trees. How about this one? The Hoopa Indians call them big boss of the woods. They, they probably got that uh, understanding who ruled the roost. Fascinating when you go to the Salish or Salish Indians, uh, Sasquatch, wild man of the woods. But uh, this is interesting. The Spokane Indians, from which the city is named after, tall burnt hair. Some of the Yakima and the Puyallup tribes call them the stick Indian. Uh, the uh, coastal Salish Indians call them one who runs and hides. The Chinook Indians call them the evil god of the woods. Again, the devil of the forest, the unknown. Uh, uh, the Okanagan Indians call them owl woman. And that's really important to Native American culture and Native American legends because big owl is basically another word for Bigfoot. Uh, Yakima, also spirit hidden by the woods. Uh, spirit spear, and it goes on and on and on. I think I've given everybody uh, enough. But I mean, I, in, in my book, I'll go through every name I've been able to find. But the Eastern Athabascan Indians knew exactly. I think they gave the best definition of all: the wicked cannibal. Because as I go into, and as my research uh, uh, partner uh, and goes into this stuff with the Navajo, it's interesting what they're talking about. And by the way, uh, I mean, he sent me an email, and I, I'm going to post it just to show people that somebody he knows, I think I referred to this, has taken a couple shots at him. The thing just stopped in his track. Its glowing red eyes went to a hot red glow, and then just kind of grunted and ran off. And the speed at which these things move is fascinating because based on all of the legends of these things, they're moving at some place close to 40 to 45 miles an hour. Same thing as a buffalo. So uh, I'll be posting pretty soon as we get closer to getting the publication, uh, the, the, the front cover of my book, which is uh, my, uh, when I hired Brian Snowdy, who, in my opinion, is one of the best uh, uh, sketch artists and truly talented men in the world. When I put uh, the legends of the Indians to him, he's, if you go on my website, you'll see the, the six-footed Indian, I'm sorry, six-finger, six-toed India, Indian who's got to be close to 14, 16 feet tall, grabbing a buffalo under their arms. Well, buffaloes can hit 40, 45 miles an hour within a few steps. If you've ever been to Yellowstone Park and watch them when they get spooked, you wouldn't want to be uh, very far away. Uh, forgive me, you wouldn't be want to be very close. You want to be very far away because those things move quicker than you can. Uh, you can even imagine. So, well, we see the headlines on Mail Online. Wanted adventurous woman to give birth to Neanderthal man. People typically ask me, do you believe that Bigfoot was a genetic alteration or a separate and distinct life form from mankind? And my answer to that is absolutely. Because the history of the world predates even the modern and contemporary, if you will, mindset to even go to, quote, the Neanderthals. When I asked one time a certain man that fights this stuff that goes bump in the night, I said, so how many different species of this stuff do you guys have to deal with? And he asked me a question. He said, how many uh, species of insects are there? And I, he's, and I said, well, look, I mean, hundreds of thousands. He said, that's <laughs> the way it is in that world. Now, look, wow. well, I, I would have thought, you know, maybe there's a half a dozen, you know, you've got uh, uh, chupacabra, you've got this, you've got that, maybe a hundred, but a couple hundred thousand. I asked him the same thing about aliens, meaning not, again, when I speak aliens, I all, always assume I'm talking what I call extra dimensionals. I do not call them extraterrestrials. I call them extra dimensionals because when you're dealing with stargates, and this is an answer that I'd like to give to someone who sent me an email today, asked me a question. Well, how do these things come and go, and where do they hide, and where are the giants now, and where do the fallen angels? All those different questions, if you understand what a stargate or a portal is or what the Native Americans spent massive amounts of time telling in their oral tradition, in their legends, and when you see that almost every culture in the world that portrays a stargate does it as a spiral, you know, just a, kind of a spiral, a two-dimensional spiral on a rock or engraved on something, if you begin to understand that this thing is much bigger than most people want to give it credit for. 
So as HARP, let's talk about High Frequency Active Aurora Research Project. And as I told people, it's fascinating to me that there are 72 ionospheric heaters worldwide. And, and I won't go into demonology, but I will explain something. There are 72 goetic, G-O-E-T-I-C, demons. And those demons, and you just call them, I always remember them, gate demons. And so somebody's working awful hard to coordinate the loosing of those things which have been bound by the living God for the benefit and safety of his people. Now, I want to make this clear. Wait, wait, as these Steve, things, Steve, we have, you know, Steve, uh, uh, can I interrupt you just for a second? I apologize. Sure. Well, there, are 70, there are 72 what? Uh, you said there are 72 of, the, of these devices, right? No, Demon. yeah, there are 72 harp, I'm sorry, 72 ionospheric heaters, okay? And, and basically okay. microwave and ultrawave transmitters. Okay, all right, okay. That's, and I just and those, sure those are, that. those, yeah, alter the electromagnetic and the other properties of the atmosphere. And it's their coordinating, Doug, if you will. Imagine a lattice or a matrix of these things, and, and just make it real simple. Imagine these are a bunch of, of combination locks that have been locked up, but someone's trying to turn all the dials at the same time and open all the vault doors at the same time. Does that help? It, uh, yes, yes, it does. Thank you for clarifying. I'm it trying up. to give you a picture. So what I said is there are 72 demons, or you know, in this case, very strong supernatural entities, whether they're principalities or powers or whatever, you know, simply, and I believe that the word demon may be misapplied in that, but that's what they're known as, the goetic demons. And again, a demon is a disembodied spirit, but a principality and power and archons are much higher than that. Now, again, I don't want to get too far into that because I want to talk about terra firma and I want to talk about Bigfoot. The big feet and Bigfoot sightings are increasing so dramatically that two weeks ago, I must have got a half a dozen of them. I have a brother, Marcus, who's uh, and by the way, ladies and gentlemen, pray for brother Marcus. He's a guy that literally is a missionary to one of the reservations out in the uh, Mountain West, and he is dealing with people that are freaked out, uh, Native Americans that are freaked out because they're seeing this stuff happening. And uh, Marcus sent me an email a number of months ago saying, please, Steve, pray for us. And, and I did ask for prayer back then and stuff. But the point being is, is that it's not just Marcus in uh, South Dakota or North Dakota, and it's not just the Navajo in Colorado, Utah, and Arizona and the Four Corners region. I mean, it's all over the place, Doug. So something has been systematically or is being systematically loosed. And that's what I'm telling people. We have to acknowledge and recognize that there is power in the name of Jesus. There's power in the blood of Jesus. And for people that think that they can take this stuff on in their own power and strength, good luck because, you know, you cannot do it. It's one thing to be tough and have weapons and fight what you can see. It's a whole other world not to have the weapons that work in, against that which you cannot see. But the Christians are not in that realm if they will finally recognize who Jesus truly is and the authority they truly have as believers. All right, uh, that makes perfect sense. And, and I'll tell you what, that's a great foundation, by the way, for uh, for all of this. Now, I, I, can, I, can I ask an academic question? This comes sure. from... A, a, okay, this comes from a listener in Norway, uh, so I want to get this out of the way. Um, and, and I kind of have, in, in a way, um, have a, a question about this. When well, we're talking about this, and we're talking about the Bible, of what significance, um, for example, of giants? Uh, Bible, uh, you, you have many Bible-based uh, quotations in your book, uh, Genesis, Genesis 6, uh, Giants, okay, which I've got here on my desk. But... Um, uh, I, Joe, help me out here because with, with that with that question and yeah. Because well, yesterday when uh, we wanted to come back from the second hour, uh, we were talking to ourselves, not knowing we were off air. But um, I started referencing some of the Bible verses where you quoted uh, that the giants are referenced and Nephilim are referenced. And um, if we could just have a more biblically uh, a biblical understanding, lay out that foundation and and why it applies to us. Uh, today and that's yeah, probably where you're going. And, and that's 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 Andre's question out of Norway. How does what you're talking about 
apply to us today. Uh, because it's all related. I guess I'm missing something or he's missing something. Let me make it plain and simple. Most people do not understand what the days of Noah were like. It was such a time of entities that were not only human. That's what Jesus said you're going to deal with. And so if people don't understand, see, no offense, Doug, but that, that, that question tells me that I'm not making it clear enough for you or Joe or most of the listeners. The point is, is that we are going to deal with these things, okay? When Jesus said men's hearts are going to fail them for fear for looking after those things coming upon the earth, what does that mean, you know? What does that mean? Because it, it, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, you're literally, they're going to die of a heart attack. Have you ever heard scared to death? What, yeah, exactly. What I, exactly. And what I'm trying to say is, is, is this. Now listen, the fallen angels and the demons and the giants, the giants are coming back, but the demons that have been bound, okay, and have been, and the same thing with specific groups of angels, when the fallen angels, evil angels, they're going to wreak havoc on the planet. And I would dare say that the man in Norway has very little understanding. I'm not picking on him, but I'm just saying he needs to get caught up to speed because that is really, and he may not even have ever embraced of stuff, but most people think that, you know, that the Bible uh, uh, deals with uh, five points and they fail to see the uh, one billion that come after that. And so what I'm trying to say to all that are listening, because that, that question kind of, it surprises me, Doug, it truly does. What Jesus said, yeah. what Jesus said is we're going to be dealing with things that we've never dealt with before. Mankind has never dealt with. And if the days were not shortened, there'd be no flesh left alive, okay? Right. So and, tell and me I this. Apologize, uh, for that. No, I, no, I, you don't I, have I to apologize. apologize. And, and please, I'm not trying to be defensive. I'm trying to be informative. So what we're talking about, and, and see, can I say this? If you guys aren't getting it, then I'm not being clear enough, okay? So I'm trying to be extra clear in how I am saying this. Everything we're talking about, whether it's Bigfoot, whether it's Nephilim, whether it's Rephaim, whether it's aliens, that's what people are going to be dealing with. They're going to be dealing with that which has been invisible becoming visible. They're going to have to deal with that which they thought were only legends breaking into the realm of reality. They're talking about extra dimensionals that had been bound out of God. God's love and mercy, and, and and if somebody wants to ask that question, I, and maybe maybe I'm 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 not being clear on this. Before the man in Norway or you, Doug or Joe, ask that question, you guys both need to go and read the book of Giants. It's just the you know specific things and the book of Enoch to get the basic plan that the fallen angels of that were bound are now being loosed, and there are some that were not bound. Only the ones that created sex sin or uh, initiated sex sin, and the hardest point to get across, and this is what you're struggling with, both of you guys and the guy in Norway, is we're dealing with those times. So when people say, just as in the days of Noah, they think, well, that's just a metaphor. No, it's not. It's the most articulate, most multidimensional, and infinite in its uh, 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 ramification statement, I believe, that Jesus made concerning the end times. Okay, and, and let me just uh, two things here. It's it's Andre, and it's a female. I apologize. Oh, okay, Andre, Andrea. Okay, okay, and and that that was my fault. And the second part of that, she uh, she asked, are we going to be fighting these uh, entities, uh, or are we just going to be? I mean, in other words, uh, are, are as they show themselves, are we going to be made to go against them or fight these entities? I mean, that was her. That was the second part of that question. Her question. Uh, well, how about this? You know, yes so, and yes. Okay. All right. And, and it's yes yeah, I and yes. Make sure that question was answered. All right. Uh, very good. Well, so so as in the days of Noah, so we're gonna we are going to experience things we've never seen before, and our hearts are gonna fail us. Our our hearts are gonna fail us for unless for, our hearts for what unless our hearts are prepared. Look, here's the deal. Everybody in the country right now, in the United States, is caught up, but the whole world's caught up in the financial realm. Okay. Everybody basically has to make a living. They go to work. They got to pay mortgages. They have them. They basically have to put their kids through college. But it's pretty much why anymore. You know, the point is, is that everybody's got the rhythm of life that they consider that I would determine. Let's just call it the normal rhythm of life. 
the normal rhythm of life doesn't deal with fallen angels, demons, doesn't deal with Bigfoot, doesn't deal with uh, uh, the arcane history of antiquity, but all the people that came before us up until a certain point had to deal with that stuff, included, including more so than anybody, the Native Americans that were both in America and South America, and even people would be surprised to know that if you're talking about the history of the United States of America, you're dealing with giants, you're, and let's just say the continent of North America and the continent of South America, you're dealing with myths and legends, and you're dealing with red-haired giants in Lovelock, Nevada, that are also recorded as coming from China and inhabiting China. So what, this isn't just to, quote, get on and wow. give people entertainment. What this is is boot camp for the supernatural, okay? That's a good way of putting it. This is, and, and I can understand this, Doug, and please let me make a statement. I understand this from the words of Jesus. That's who teaches me. That's who obviously empowers me. That's who called me, and that's who he who equips me. But again, I find it so uh, telling and compelling that Jesus said to the most religious people, even scholars that knew the Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets, they could quote it backwards and forwards, they could quote the feast, but basically he said, if I tell you earthly things and you believe me not, how can I tell you heavenly things? And then Jesus scolds them and says, look, you can look up in the sky, I'm paraphrasing, and see that you see the clouds, you say it's going to rain today, but you don't see what's before you. That's what I'm trying to say. It's not what is before us now, the normal rhythm of life we've got to deal with, it's what's coming our way, and unless you understand that, most 1.2 billion Catholics, the, the war that's going to be in the Catholic Church between the traditional Catholics, and this is not Catholic bashing, and though Catholics that are, are into the new doctrine and dogma, it's going to be horrific. It's going to basically, and not only in the Catholic Church, this is coming into Protestantism, this is coming throughout the world, and, and what I'm saying is everyone's belief system is going to be uh, upset, it's going to be perilous, people are going to see things and they're going to want answers. Do you think the average guy that's up in the pulpit, and look, I am not a basher of the men of God who preach the word of God. I'm talking about hirelings and whorelings, okay? That's a new word, by the way, whorling, okay? <laughs> W-H-O-R-E-L-I-N-G. I, I, you know, I want you to know I invented that word just for tonight, okay? The bottom, the bottom if you will, the, the point that I'm trying to make is that when truth is first presented, it, the natural man has to basically put it aside, put it away, belittle it, or in America, shoot the messenger, okay? They'd rather shoot the messenger than hear the message, and so after enough evidence and time has come that they can emotionally settle down, and emotions of good word, because that's something that takes place in the soul of man, not in the spirit of man. The things of God are revealed through the spirit of God to the spirit of man. The soulish things, mind, will, intellect, and emotions, that's soul. The Greek word for that is suke. P-S-Y-C-H-E. We get the word psychology. We get the word psychiatric, psychotic psychoanalysis, all the words that begin with psycho are basically dealing with the human uh, interaction with their world around them through their five senses. The Spirit of God, when a man becomes born again or a woman becomes born again, we basically get a new uh, spiritual sense where we can begin to discern the Spirit of God versus our emotions, and our emotions will war against the spirit within us that God's trying to birth because it isn't rational. Uh, basically, Jesus said, if you don't believe me for this, believe me for that. And, and you know, even the Pharisees that were trying to, you know, basically uh, 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 bring accusations against Jesus couldn't deny the fact that, look, they can say what they want, but no man's ever done the things that this man has done, meaning Jesus, or John writes in the book of John that if all the books that were ever written in the world, they couldn't contain everything that Jesus did. All we get is the highlights in the Gospels, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We get four different perspectives of four different men and seeing different attributes of Jesus, but we don't realize all the things that Jesus did. Listen, if you're the Son of God, as Jesus is, and you come to redeem mankind, then you're going to make it uh, clear to every single person. Doug, there are people that would get 
upset religious people if a, if a prostitute came into their congregation. Now look, Jesus basically uh, didn't come to save those who have no need for salvation. There are people that just simply don't want it. But to those who are sick, those are who he comes to as a great physician. And the sickness throughout the world is sin, S-I-N. Sin means to miss the mark. It means that God intended for us such a marvelous, marvelous state of existence and such a glorious future. And Satan, in his rage and contempt for mankind, sought to destroy the very seed of God. And that's why the book of Genesis basically says there's enmity between God's seed and the serpent's seed, okay? So we're, we're in a time period now that it's not been like this, whether we're starting the tribulation, beginning the tribulation, or are you know, ready to go into the tribulation. The issue is we're confronted with prophecies from whether it's St. Malachi, whether it's Nostradamus, but all of them, by the way, go back to the book of Revelation. But everybody that quotes the book of Revelation, and I've been saying this for 20 years on talk radio, everybody that quotes the book of Revelation don't recognize it's not the revelation of bad stuff that's going to come. It's a revelation that God gave to his servant John, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And all the scrolls that are open, the only one worthy in all of creation to open those by God's assignment is his son, Jesus. And so it's funny, when I get into arguments with uh, people that are of the Muslim persuasion, they say, God has no children. And I say, was Solomon a wise man? They acknowledge Solomon. Was Jesus a prophet? I said, you, you know, they'll acknowledge that. But Solomon in his wisdom, uh, in, in talking in Proverbs, says, tell me if you have wisdom, uh, Lemuel, what is God's name or what is his son's name? Uh, excuse me, that's one of the oldest books in the Old Testament. So right there, you know, you've got a situation, whether you want to quote the book of Genesis, let us make man in our image. It's certainly not God calling on Lucifer for his approval. So we're, we're in a realm now where the total contempt for human life, and here's where I'll bring it kind of to, I think, a conclusion on this one point. The contempt for human life has never been echoed to the degree it's being echoed. The plans, the chemtrail spraying, the geoengineering, the genetic manipulation of our food, of our, uh, the, the manipulation of our water, uh, the vaccinations they want to give us. And I still like the little rhyme that I came up with years ago. Shot in the arm, shot in the head, either way you end up dead. Listen, the <laughs> amount of evidence of vaccination and its byproducts, by, uh, it's not byproducts, but the, the physical ailments that are attributed to vaccination are beyond anybody's challenge. Yet people will not do their own homework. And now laws are being written. And we're hearing about, about swarming drones that literally can overwhelm you and they can sting you or they can blow you up or they can do this, do that, or do the other thing. When in the world, and, and, and at no time in the world, has technology become so, uh, what would you say, profuse in, 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 profuse in its use? And it's interesting, isn't it? Guess who's being targeted, everyone who's listening to this program tonight? You are. If you're not one of them, you're a target. And, and just like Doug, uh, uh, two years ago, I said to the vets, I said, you guys are being targeted. You're going to be vilified. They're going to build a case against you, and then you're going to be destroyed. I just posted a story on my website about supposedly, I cannot prove it yet, but go and read it for yourself, vets. I said, I thought there might have been hope if in a peaceful assembly, and I stress peaceful, nonviolent, I said, if all the vets would rally and have marches across the country saying, we fought for this country, we are not this country's enemies. If you go to my website, stevequail.com, the top story is about now the vets are going to be given letters they can't own guns. They can go and bleed and die and kill on command, but when they come back, if they own a gun, they will be killed on the same people that put them in the foreign fields. They'll be killed on command. Doesn't that sound a little bit duplicitous? So when somebody says, uh, you know, how, how is this stuff important, I can only say this. It's the most important time in history, because this is what Jesus talked about when he said, lo, I am with you, even to the end of the age. I deal with, uh, how should I say this? I've got to be really kind here. I deal with people on a daily basis that, are, that transcend all spectrums of life and all walks of life and all areas of the world. And I can't answer them all. My standard statement to anybody that would send me an email on aliens 
giants or any of this stuff, I won't answer your questions until you've at least read my book. Not because I want to sell books. It's because I have spent 40 years of my life laying it out in a book form. And I'm telling you, Doug, that and, and Joe, and I don't know that you guys have read my books, and I'm, this isn't putting you on the spot or embarrassing you, but th that I didn't write that stuff just to fill paper to put in an envelope to mail out. It's the thing that it's 40 years of my investigation to prepare people for this day. And if people cannot apply themselves to knowledge, then unfortunately they're going to be overwhelmed when their sensory organs, what they see, what they hear, what they smell, what they uh, embrace, what they come into contact with, it's going to simply overwhelm, it's going to bulldoze them. And that's why Jesus was talking, and, and, and so many times uh, Paul was talking about the love of the great body waxing cold because the deception of seducing spirits. Listen, you can't seduce anything or anyone unless you give them something they want or they desire. You can't do it. A woman can make, well, I better go. I'm not going to go there, okay? I'll stop there. The bottom line is in order to seduce, you have to be ready to give something that somebody wants. The Illuminati is seduced on one word, and it's not money, it's power. What does God give his people? He says to his, the scripture says, to as many as received Jesus, gave he, God, the power to become the sons of God. You cannot live as a Christian without the power of God. If you are living as a Christian without the power of God, then you're living beneath your inheritance, and you're not recognizing who the scripture says you are, but more importantly, you're not recognizing who your Savior is and who his Father is. And uh, the Bible, uh, you know, is distinct in separating the God against all the wannabe fallen angels. And that's the only way I know to how to answer everything that we've talked about up to this point. Gotcha. No, no, it's, it's you know, it's it, really, though, Steve, I, I mean, you know, whether it's uh, Andrea in Norway or, or Joe, average citizen on the street, uh, those without the, the knowledge that you've imparted here in Giants, uh, Genesis 6 Giants, uh, it's really kind of like a, a huge and bitter pill to swallow that, that we are going to be actually seeing this. And, and I think, too, a lot of blame, too, goes to the allegorical uh, people taking the Bible as an allegory uh, as opposed to literally. Um, I think that has a lot to do with it. But, uh, you know, so, so no, it's, it's, uh, you've laid out a great foundation here. Um, so, uh, and, and, okay, another thing, too, uh, uh, I just got a message here from uh, from someone else. Uh, uh, I'm not sure where this individual is from, but is it not true that uh, what you're talking about, they, the people in power want to buy or want to uh, harness the future? That's what they're after. You said they're after power, but is it not the future, their, their, their future well, sure. Uh, you, know, you know, it's it's like, and, and boy, tonight's not a good time for quantum physics. But let me give you a good example of a headline that was on Drudge today. What do you see is the number one concern for Zuckerberg, you know, of Facebook fame, and uh, uh, oh, the Google guy. You know what I'm saying? What was it? Did you see the yeah. story, Doug? No, uh, I, I, and I can't I think not. of his name. It, guess what? It's what? Lo it's long. It's long. Uh, human life. Yeah, they granted yeah, three million dollars to eleven scientists to research right. and advance human life. Yeah. Okay, now let me share this with you. Here is the promise the devil has given. Please, Christians, pray right now that you'll hear this truth, because what you're being told or what you're seeing in the headlines, thank you, Jesus. What you're seeing is the oldest lie in the world: "Ye shall not surely die." If you don't die as a Luciferian or being told you'll never see death, therefore you'll never face judgment, therefore you can live apart from the living God, not bound by his laws or his creative uh, demands, then that's going to sound pretty good to you, especially if you're a billionaire. You mean, do you know how many, uh, you know, I, I can't say it that way. I'm really trying to watch how I talk. <laughs> you, you know how much, uh, let's just put it this way, do you know my, how much, fun you can have if you get to keep your money and live like you want to live and you can live totally like as as my brother david langford would say in north carolina you can live like hail okay and not have to face the consequences because that's the same thing is it not joe what what did the devil say when eve said but the lord said you know if we eat it we're gonna die but what did the devil say joe that you shall surely not die you shall 
uh, know the difference between uh, good and evil. Good job. And that's exactly what they're being promised right now. Do you follow me? Okay. They're yeah, being absolutely. promised. Oh. They're, they're being promised. They're, listen, in my book, Aliens and Fallen Angels, and, and, and if I get the books wrong, it's not intentional, or maybe in Genetic Armageddon, or maybe in both. And, and after, uh, I think I'm up to, you know, 14,000 footnotes. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I don't mean to mislead, but I will tell you this. It's in Aliens and Fallen Angels. The Methuselah gene, M-E-T-H-U-L-A, you know, Methuselah, A-A-L-E-H or whatever. Uh, just type it in, and you will, what Methuselah lived, was, he's the oldest man in the Bible. How long did he live? He lived almost a 1,000 years, okay? Uh, what, 969 years or something? And so when you're dealing with people who had longevity, these are not metaphoric or allegorical licenses. These gentlemen lived that long. And the thing that's interesting is, is that, that that gene and that process that kept Methuselah or Enoch 365 years or whoever, I mean, you can go into the Bible or just type in uh, Bible patriarchs longevity and you get a list of them. What is happening is they had specific enzymes and they had a different, if you will, uh, not only digestive tract, but endocrine system and everything else. And God gave them what Adam had originally was eternal life in the garden until he chose to disobey and sin. And with Eve, they both sinned, okay? But the point is, is that this is what's going on in the headlines. So you can say, oh, I think that quail's whacked out, blah, blah, blah. I, and I would just say, I would say to all of you, then why is it that uh, Bryn, Sergey Bryn and Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Facebook guy or Zuckerberg, the bottom line is they're going to go give that amount of money to scientists for long life, okay? And that's what the devil's promising these people. That's what, what's the promise of vampirism, you guys? What are vampires uh, noted for? Well, never dying. I mean, you know, they never die. But what has yeah. to happen in order for them never to die? They're going to be bitten uh, by another vampire, right? And they have to I mean, continually feast on the life force that's in the blood. Correct? Correct. Sorry about that. Yeah, okay. I was. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, 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 isn't it fascinating? And see, this is what this is what I, I and look I. I, I tell people, you would not want to be me, and you would not want to know what I know, and I don't brag about it. It's just with much knowledge comes much sorrow, and, and I'm, I can only tell you this. It's nothing about self-pity. It's about how do you help people that are going to come into the most horrific Those of you that are being led, and the Lord is speaking to you about this stuff, Copy everything that is on my Genesis 6 website. Copy it, print it out, because there's going to come a dime time where basically the website will be gone. And for those of you that want it all put together, the easiest way, and I can tell you this, I'd rather read a book on this stuff personally than I, I don't know what my college degree costs. You know what, 40000 $50,000. I got two degrees, and uh, sometimes trying to deal with God's people, it seems like all I get is a third degree. But the point is, is that <laughs> that's another attempt at humor. The point is, Doug, is that, you know, the price of a book like Aliens of Fallen Angels or Angel Wars or Genesis 6 Giants, I mean, I don't know how to explain to people, but all the questions that I have ever been asked are addressed in those three books in one form or another. And believe me, I get a lot of questions. And I want to make this comment. I know nothing about human relationships. I am not the guy to give anybody marital advice, okay? I got a, I got a dear brother, and the guy defends me and everything, and I don't know how to give anybody advice about how to get along with the opposite sex. So please don't send me those emails, okay? I'm, I'm not kidding, Doug, in what I'm saying. It's frustrating. I don't have the mind of the Lord. I know what the scriptures say, but I also know that Paul said, this is what the scripture says, and I speak this by license. There's a lot of people who are struggling in their marriage. Heck, everybody who is married struggles at some point or another. And, 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 and there are so many people that are coming out of broken homes, broken backgrounds, and if you've got a tumultuous and distorted uh, home life and you grew up in the worst of conditions, then I suggest you go to Life Skills uh, International, Paul Hagstrom, and he's got he's the one to talk about relationships and stuff. So please, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not the dear Abby 
of, of uh, uh, marital advice. I cannot step into that realm, okay? It's not my calling. I have to stay with my calling. Just like tonight, Doug, before I went on the show, I've got people wanting me to address this and address that. No, I can't do what the people want. I have to do what the Lord tells me to because I know what happened to King Saul when he listened to the people versus the voice of the Lord. You know the story, don't you? It cost him his yeah, kingdom. And so I could yeah. care less, and I don't mean this to be mean, mean-spirited, and will all the whiners and the weenies just suck it up and keep your thoughts to yourself and say this, if this man is trying to give me something to save my life, if this man is trying to present me with a battle that's yet on my horizon and tell me how to overcome it, maybe I should listen, and I'll, I'll, I'll trust God. The ultimate relationship fixer-upper is Jesus. And I cannot do what only he can do. So I just had to get that out, Doug, because it, it's really frustrating to me when people say, could you tell me what to do with my wife? No, I can't. I have enough issues. You know, I'm just walking out my salvation, my own marriage every day. And I think, again, everybody needs to, you know, know to the, go to the Lord with those kind of problems, okay? Do we need to take a break? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, in fact, we do, Steve. Uh, folks who are listening to the Hagman Hagman Report, our very special guest tonight is Mr. Steve Quayle. This is kind of a redo of yesterday. Uh, stay with us. We're going to be back in about three and a half minutes. We promise. Welcome back, folks, to the Hagman Hagman Report. Today is Thursday. It's the 21st day of February 2013. This is a live broadcast. Our very special guest, Mr. Steve Quayle, stevequayle.com, and also uh, uh, Genesis the number six giants.com that's genesis six giants.com and we're talking about things right before, during the break joe, joe said something and i thought it was pretty profound he said uh, isn't it amazing that people fear what they don't understand and and i think that that's that that's a really great statement and i think that that's why steve well that, that is why steve is here to talk about this and in my hands i've got uh, steve's book angel wars and i can tell you that uh uh it's a phenomenal book, uh, but one one of the opening paragraphs in the introduction says this. Uh, Steve writes, I can promise you that you're about to fall into an Alice in Wonderland rabbit hole while choosing the blue pill uh, of the Matrix. And as you continue to, to read, like the character Jim Carrey played in The Truman Show, you'll discover you've been living in a dream world of false facades, or things to appear to be one thing, but in reality are something quite different with secret hands directing all that goes on around you. And, you know, from the conversations I've had with people in the intelligence world, and I know Steve has his contacts, which are extremely uh, high up there, this is a matter of uh, our security. It's a matter of national security. It's a matter of eternal salvation. I mean, all things are rolled up into one. So what Steve's talking about tonight um, with, in particular, the, the, the Giants aspect, how it plays all in, um, even that question from Norway, that, that very academic question, how does this all play in? Well, you know, my, not only will my pe people uh, perish for lack of knowledge, uh, you know, there's also that, uh, that that fright condition. And as I circle back around, you know, people are afraid what, of what they don't know and understand. And with that, uh, welcome back, Steve. I want to read an email that says it, what, why I do what I do. And somebody said, why not call it quits? And the, even the people that listen to me that knock us off the air, you know, and again, I, I can only tell you, um, you know, some people think I make this stuff up when huge amounts of money are brought. But here's the reason I do it. The Bible says, he who winneth souls is wise. And this is a guy that, and, and I love his pen name, I am Scott Free. He said, I want to thank you. You know, he calls me Mr. Quayle. Well, thank you, but I prefer you guys call me Steve. Your work is not only fascinating, but brought me back to the truth of the Lord Jesus. After my brother passed, I backslid and fell for the ancient alien lie. He said, I heard you and Stan Dale, and I had an awakening. Thank you and bless you. So the point that I'm trying to make in all this is, listen, I know for a fact there's a hunger in God's people's heart for truth. If there's no hunger, then you better question your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you know all the answers, then write a book and I'll buy your book. I don't know all, all the answers. All I know is the area that the Lord has called me to address. Obviously, I have shared my testimony enough times, and when people say, who do you think you are? I said, well, actually, I'm like the guy on the street corner that basically has no righteousness of his own. I know what kind of a 
total, um, how should I say this, disgusting human being I was before I met Jesus. And so all I can do is beat my breast, and instead of saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, I just say, Jesus, thank you for being merciful to me, a sinner. I mean, there's a big difference. One is a joyful thing. And the thing that, that I can say is this, is that if there's any of those of you out there that are still puzzled or you're traumatized by abductions, you're traumatized by demons. And I've, I hear from more Christians having uh, encounters with evil spirits. I'm hearing from Christians who have been raped by an incubus, that's a male demon, or men who have been raped by a succubus, that's a female demon. And the point that I want people to understand is this, is that God's word has answers. For instance, the whole 91st Psalm, the terror that comes by night, that's talking about Lilith the night hag, okay? Well, if you don't understand who Lilith the night hag is, and when you understand the word man-eater, and uh, man-eater literally means a uh, woman in this context, I'm going to be really as, uh, how do I say this? As careful as I know how to be. I can be blunt, by the way. I can be so blunt. I'm not trying to be blunt and offensive. But let me just say this. Imagine a woman who uh, lures a man sexually and then starts to devour him from his uh, private parts up. That's where the word man-eater came from in history. It has nothing to do with a song written by Michael Cimbello for Flashdance, although, you know, maybe that was a good song. I don't know. But the point is, I wonder how I knew that. Well, the point is, is that we're <laughs> dealing with, uh, with such amazing historical facts. So when you're talking about the terror that comes by night, what did that mean in the 91st Psalm? Well, the point is, is that it has a lot to say because, look, when you're dealing with the context of our ancient forefathers who fought the good fight of faith, whether it's King David taking down Goliath, and, you know, I, there are wimpy people who, uh, you know, I don't know ancient Chaldean. But I can tell you this, when I know a hundred ancient accounts of how big Goliath was, for someone to claim that David's 5'2 and Goliath is 6'2, that man is basically an intellectual whore. And I won't name him, but I, I, I just will tell you, that's a lie. Then you've got guys who do great work, but attribute everything to the Anunnaki. Zechariah Sitchin did some great work. Well, Sitchin couldn't make the uh, connection between the Anunnaki, meaning those from... Uh, those f who from heaven to earth came, and basically the fallen angels. You know, and the Anunnaki, Anu is, is one of the gods of the epic of Gilgamesh. Gods meaning little g, you know, fallen angels. So this stuff is important, Doug, because what people don't realize is, is that they use words every day. They use words that came into being out of a, 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 an entire different world of real usage. You can, you can redefine words all you want, but if you want to know what the intent of the writers who use them was, you have to go back into the context of their vocabulary. First of all, one of the great words I know, if I say to both of you, what does the word berserk mean? Okay, I love this, berserk. What does it mean? Uh, crazy. How's that? Crazy, okay. Would you believe that word came from a German or a Germanic tribe of giants that destroyed 30,000 Romans in an afternoon, and they were giants? I mean, these guys were not, uh, you know, uh, just imagine 9 to 12 foot entities and uh, basically using Roman soldiers for shish kebab on the end of their spears, and the name of them were the Berserkers, B-E-R-S-E-R-K-E-R-S, -E 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 okay? Or let's take uh, Jack the Giant Killer. And if you've never read the British Isles uh, giant stories, it's fascinating because the statement, fee, fi, fo, fum, I smell the blood of an Englishman. It took a uh, high-ranking military officer to tell me the reason that they smell. It's how the giants, it's, and this was interesting to me, he, he, he said they track by the harmonics of the scent of your DNA. Okay. And, and that's interesting to me. Just like a bloodhound would track, these, that's how the giants hunted their prey. That's why the Native Americans, 
you know, basically had to use so much smoke, and that's how they would basically take on the giants, and they do it with the copper spear, solid copper, and somebody wanted me to address this tonight, and that was told to me. I couldn't know this stuff, Doug, unless the people that really fight these things told me. And then they said, well, how do you know they're not giving you a line of bull? Because I can go into history and read how the uh, Indians and Native Americans fought them, and it, it, it all lines up. So the point is, and why did David cut off Goliath's head? He cut off his head because the giants have a, an amazing ability to spontaneously regenerate unless the head is severed. I had a four-star general tell me that, and thank you, uh, 357 Sig, for that. The point is, okay, is that... Yeah. No, okay, now, just to, just to add or buttress what you're saying there, okay, I had a conversation, a recent conversation with somebody you know, one of my contacts, okay? Okay. And he, and he, said, he said a couple of things. I want to kind of get your, get your take on this because, to me, this just absolutely blew my mind. And, folks, uh, uh, just, you know, uh, listen to Steve's response, okay? The, the first thing he told me, consciousness resides outside of the body. Okay, now, if that is true, and let's assume for the purpose, just for a second here, before you respond, let's assume that's true. He said, think of it this way. Everyone's DNA is slightly different in harmonic frequency. Mine's a little different than yours. You know, we're like, kind of like antennas. DNAs are like antenna, antennae, perhaps, um, where the harmonics are, are just a touch different than each other's. Now, the people that we're talking about, the, the Luciferians, the Illuminati, the Illuminists, the people in power, and, and this is what, where it applies to today since we're talking about this, believe just as like your consciousness as well as your memories resides outside the body. And if you can imagine this big hard drive, you know, with, with uh, somewhere, virtual hard drive or a cloud, you know, an Internet cloud of consciousness, um, the people today believe that they, when, that, that they can actually um, – even if they die, perhaps they can, uh, um, uh, uh, through DNA manipulation, live again and reaccess, we'll say, the consciousness of pharaohs or even their own conscious that's resonant outside the body. Does that make sense, or did I screw that up? And, yeah, and yeah, and, and what you know, obviously I hope you're sort of, but let's just make it clear. I don't know his name. I don't know anything. I just right. know of him and that's for his sake and my sake so you know and and for the record i was contacted by uh some law enforcement guys on a federal level and they said they can't tell me their names and uh had some questions and i sent them back an email say i said brother i don't and the guy's a christian i said i don't ask anybody's names you see when i hear well tell us your name or you're just making this stuff up i basically say go back to the hole you crawled out of you child of hell you spawn of heaven's rebellion because those are the kind of questions where you know i can't give up any names if i don't know the name so it is my my operating style not to request or need to know names how I do it I try and get two or three verifications sure I get snookered sometimes most of the times it's people taking old news stories and sending them to me look I'm a one-man show meaning that I've got a you know I have my Daryl my guy that that puts up some of the stuff on my website but I'm responsible for it but when you you know what it's like Doug I'm not making excuses but uh, oh, yeah. when I'm writing oh, yeah. The biggest book of my life, okay, and 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 thank God, Mac, bless you, thank you, thank God, uh, Dennis and Shanna, thank God for all of you that are helping me in this realm. It is a it's a composite effort, but I'm still, if you will, the captain of the ship, and I can only say this: if if people understood the amount of data that I have to sort through, they just simply couldn't handle it. They can't. And because I'm wired different than most people, and I've actually had brain scans and gone into spec scans, and if you know what those are, and, and uh -huh. I've been told, boy, you don't, you don't function like most people. You know, and that's why I used to get balled out by certain people for not being able to follow instructions. I said, yeah, if I build a swing set, it looks like something Edward Scissorhands would build, you know. <laughs> and, and, I mean, yeah, I just can't do it, okay. And, and to me, you know, an instruction book is nothing more than an effective target for a 22. So, so the thing that I'm trying to say here is this, is that the amount of data that is processed, I have to try and get two or three separate validation. What your source is telling you is exactly true. Because the Illuminati, look, I was told point blank that they have, they, the Illuminati has my, uh, you know, DNA. 
and then I got pissed. And I'm sorry for using that word, but look, we're talking about the end of the age. We're talking about monsters, ghouls, goblins, demons, and that's a biblical term, just like bastard is. And if that is offensive to you, then you better check your self-righteous religious cloak at the door. And I had a, I, got, I got to tell you something. Again, the problem with most men today is, is that they have quizzicals and have not passed the testicle part of their life. And meaning that, you know, uh, the scripture when it said the, the men in the midst of thee are women, I can't tell you. All you got to do, and I don't listen to Dr. Laura, but if you listen to Dr. Laura when you're traveling and get her on the talk channel, by the way, I think she's a brilliant woman. I mean, when I hear the men there, my goodness, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm aghast. And I'll turn to my wife as she's in the car and I say, is that what's represented by men calling in Dr. Laura? Most of them, and I want to say this, you know, it's it's like, they're sniveling weenies, okay? Well, I love uh, some of the men of God that I know because they are absolutely, they are the men of God. And when men of God preach and teach the young men how to be men of God, something happens. But you can't put a wuss in the pulpit and expect anything but wussies to come out of the, of, of the congregation, you know? I mean, let me share this. If I want to go find spineless jellyfish, I'm going to go diving, okay? I can always scuba diving. I can always run into jellyfish. I just don't expect them to be the human equivalent of blobs. And not only blobs, but gobs of blobs. In other words, this is my experience. It's not out of bitterness, it's out of practicality. You cannot like produces light. You cannot teach a person the revelation of God unless God has given that revelation. And so it's amazing to me when I hear people now, the great attack is on Paul the Apostle. You know, he's not really, he's, he, you know, I mean, there's so much error. Paul said God is going to judge the world through his gospel. So when I hear people, and I, I part a company with people, if someone says they don't believe Paul, you know, I just part company with them. I will not talk to them. I will have nothing to do with them again. Because they basically have just thrown out the book of Romans, the book of Corinthians. They've thrown out all the epistles. And they're saying that their life is better than the man who persecuted the Christians, who's literally knocked off of his ass on the road to Damascus, is blinded by the glory of the Lord, told to go to Ananias, into Joppa and have, uh, have uh, you know, him pray for his eyesight. This is amazing. I have a pastor friend, Dane, ex-Special Forces guy. I love this guy. Instantly, I have, I have fellowship with him. Or my friend, Pastor Bruce. Or my friend, John Kyle. Or David Langford. David is probably one of the most amazing men of God I know. And I'm not praising him or embellishing him or flattering him. David and I are very frank to, with each other. But David is an absolute living uh, example example of God's redemptive power in a renegade. I can tell you point blank, or my friend Cornelius II. Man, he thrills my heart when he says, Steve, I burned out a pair of tires in under three, three months, you know, and, and I know how fast he drives, and I say, right on, brother. You know, and, and somebody says, well, you should not drive fast because you're endangering lives. He doesn't endanger anybody's life. He just opens it up when he's got, you see, we become a bunch of weenies. We have lost the pioneer spirit. We have lost the perseverance spirit, not all of it. And so, sure, you can go out and get a bunch of train killers that are just licking their chops to come get their shot at you, Doug, or their shot at me or Hawk or whoever, you know, Greg Evenson, God knows. And But I want you guys to know, be, be very careful because Greg's surrounded by angels and he knows how to give it back to you. So the point is, is that that's not a threat. You see, when it's shooting fish in the barrel, it's one thing. But when the fish go with bulletproof vests and they have Gatling guns in the water, and somebody goes to shoot them with a 22 and a barrage of, uh, you know, 20 millimeter, uh, you know, uh, chain gun come at them, then that's a whole different story. What I'm saying is in the spiritual metaphor, the power of God is not bound by our limitations, yet we are the one bound by our limitations because we do not know, acknowledge, or appropriate the power of God. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think you cover a lot of ground there from, from the from the uh, wimpization, uh, uh, from the metrosexuality of men, uh, the, the yeah. self castration to uh, uh, to uh, actually, yeah, I, I can cover their their inability to discern simple matters that they should know, and this comes as you know, uh, and as new PDFs have been released on the manipulation of society, culture, norms, and values, and their continuation to manipulate these norms and our culture. So people are, are 
falling in, in into this uh, way of the culture is moving instead of the way and standing strong that they should be in the word. Well, again, you know, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I try and put up quotes of the day, which really should be quotes of the week. If I leave them up, it's not that I'm too lazy to change them. But, I, you know, the quotes I put up, I, I think, Monday are still up on faith. You know, the just shall live by faith. Well, the point is, is that faith cometh here by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When the Bible says the just shall live by faith, it doesn't say the just shall live by government endowment, okay? And ultimately, Joe and Doug and everyone listening, the, though the Roman Christians were persecuted because they were told that Caesar's God, you are going to be persecuted because you're not going to acknowledge they who claim to be God, where they come in spaceships or, you know, giant fruitcakes with wings, Oh, by the way, giant fruitcakes with wings, that just pretty much uh, tells you how Congress and the Senate function, okay? The point is, is that, I knew you were say listen, that. yeah, you got that one, right? <laughs> yeah, the, the I, point, I, I knew exactly where you are going. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the point is, is that we are now at a time, unlike any in history, and I want to reiterate this again. There is no way I can cover 6,000 our, or excuse me, 6,000 years of Earth's history and then the dateless past. What I've done is spent 40 years of my life in investigation. And please, ladies and gentlemen, one thing I want to make clear too, Doug, my books are not on Amazon. If you see a report on Amazon that somebody's read my book, I don't think they can put a report on except to be fake. I had a guy call me because he got offended because I didn't agree with him. He wrote a bad report about my book and put it up on Amazon. Well, I can challenge it, but why? So, and this guy claimed to be, I'm with you, bro. The minute I hear I'm with you, bro, man, I'm telling you what, my sword is at the ready. And I'm serious. I'm talking about, and I don't mean a physical sword. I'm talking about, you know, I'm on guard. Because when you fence, when you're going to notify your partner, you know, you, what's the first thing you say? If you Peter Sellers, you say, on guard. But, you know, we would say on guard. In other words, get ready. It's how in martial arts, when you step into the ring in full contact karate, you know, you might have to bow to your opponent, but your eyes are on him at all times. And, you know, you're, you're going... His next move is going to be this, and my move is going to be this. So the, the, I guess what I'm trying to say is what I'm trying to teach people is to square off in the arena of faith because what's coming is beyond my ability to articulate it in such a way that I cannot even... I could be as gross, and when I say gross, I don't mean swearing or profane, but I just mean I could get as bloody and gory as the pictures that have filled my mind in visions and revelations from the Lord. And I can't do it, Doug. I just can't do it. And I've asked the Lord to give me license not to. I said, Lord, that's one realm you're going to have to speak to your people on. So when I put up the dreams and visions on my uh, website, stevequail.com, and I encourage everybody to go to the dreams and visions and the alert section every day because that's where the hot personal stuff goes as people come in. And I get people arguing with everything. By the way, let me just speak of the precious metals. V, my financial guy, and there are people listening to the show that don't like what he said, but at least uh, 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 JJ and, uh, and V agree on one thing. They're both, uh, JJ is one of the world's most uh, uh, famous traders in commodity, uh, exceptionally brilliant man. But you know, the gold market is being manipulated. The silver market is being manipulated. The, the, if you go and look at the charts on Kitco and go back uh, a year ago to, I think it's July, you'll see that the low on silver was 2670 and the low on gold was maybe 1540 So what they're doing, ladies and gentlemen, they're forcing, they mean J.P. Morgan and the entities that control them, the Fed, are forcing the spot market price down and they're doing that in order to allow the people they made deals with to buy up all the physical silver and gold, which there's a lot of physical silver and gold being sold. Yesterday, the two biggest, uh, uh, what would you say, uh, wholesalers in the country of uh, precious metals are both billion dollars in sales, you know, billion. I mean, th these are not little outfits. There's only six of them in the country told me they had the busiest day all year because not, and I said, is it the little guys buying? He said, absolutely not. They're scared 
you know, to use another word, but he said, but what we're seeing is people with big money coming in and buying it all up. So is that just a statement of a gold dealer who can't say, gee, the reason gold and silver are going down, V was on your radio program talking about that. You remember that, Doug? Yeah, I, I do, Steve. And, and I want to kind of ask a question that kind of extends off of what he said. Are we seeing, is this kind of a warning sign to a last gasp? if you will, of what's coming. Uh, I mean, yes. In, in other words, I think a better way to say it is, is this the last manipulation? Well, first yeah. of all, based on the amount of money going in and the amount of money coming into the gold and silver market, by the way, a billion dollars pretty much, maybe two, buys all the silver that's in existence right now. And I'm not talking in ETFs, exchange, exchange traded funds or any of that. I'm talking about physical silver and gold. I stay up on that stuff, Doug. Actually, I stay up too late at night on that stuff. But when <laughs> everyone else is sleeping, I'm watching the markets in either Japan or in London because I, I have the capability of trading 24-7, okay? And I found that my body just can't, you know, I, I'm going with four hours of sleep and my brother Bruce, who is a wonderful man of God, has said, Steve, God's going to slow you down 20% and make you 80% more effective. I thought, Bruce, I accept that word, you know, because I would love to slow down. Even a guy sent me an email tonight saying, will you slow down, uh, you know, when you're talking. Here's what I'm contending with, everyone. I'm contending with information that is absolutely, how should I say this, not only provocative, but terrifying in its ramifications. Because most of us don't live in a world of blood and gore. People who have lived in the battlefield and uh, who have basically, uh, you know, had to do cleanups on extreme accidents and slaughters and all that stuff do. But most of us simply don't, including me. Yet when I don't, and 40 years ago I'm given a vision, a literal vision of the end time events, and that's what's motivated me to write. Had I known the ridicule, had I known the scorn, had I known the hate, the death threats, the contempt, the actual, uh, if you will, the most uh, wicked expression of human depravity, I don't think I probably would have said, yes, Lord, God in his grace gave me the grace to do it, but I really don't think anybody would do it outside of being called to do it. And again, what's fascinating to me is everybody can get on the rapture bandwagon. Try getting on it when everybody's saying rapture, pre-trib rapture, pre-trib rapture, and the Lord tells you there's not going to be a pre-trib rapture. He said, my people have always had to go through the furnace of the fire, but I'm with them. Gives me Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Gives me Daniel in the lion's den. Gives me King Jehoshaphat fighting against insurmountable odds. And the Lord says, don't even take up your weapon. Just start to praise me, and I'll give you the victory. And then he has the army that would have decimated Jehoshaphat and the children of Israel turn their swords on each other. Or how about Pharaoh drowning in the sea? You know, again, the scripture basically declares that the battle is the Lord's, but we have to do our part, and our part is exercising our trust, our faith, okay, and basically coming to the conclusion, and this is hard for all of us, me too, it's really hard, that God is who he says he is and will do what he says he will do based on his promise that Jesus really meant what he said when he said, Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. You see, Doug, I could go on talk radio. I mean, I could. I, I'm not going to. Outside of the one day a week, or two days a week in this case, because of last night's interruption, I could go on and I could continue to talk about the monetary system, or the Federal Reserve, or gun confiscation, or the political, blah, 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 blah. The Lord said, Steve, I'm changing your direction. You need to minister to my people. I said, Lord, you're going to have to help me love your people because there's a whole lot of them I don't like. Okay? Now, how many people will tell you that? I had a guy throw that up in my face, and I said, Brother, the difference between me is you think it in your heart and won't say it. I know I need a change of heart, but I will tell the truth. So, you know, the point that I'm trying to get, Doug, is, is that the hardest, and, 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 I, and for my uh, point of reference, who gave Jesus the worst time? The religious people, okay? Who actually wanted the system to kill Jesus? The people who were benefiting financially from, the, you know, their religious system, okay? In other words, you know, uh, uh, they didn't want God's house to be a house of prayer. They wanted to be a television evangelist 
uh, broadcast begging for money. And that's exactly how I see those guys, okay? Don't tell me that this brother is such a wonderful thing. God doesn't build his kingdom on the widow's might. Faith demonstrates itself by the widow's might, but you don't build the kingdom of God by sucking money and the life out of people by promising them, if you just give me $239, I'll give you 239 blessings. And if you want God to like you, you need to sow into my ministry. As a guy drives a Ferrari and a Lamborghini Geraldo and has you know, multi-million dollar houses, I would say this, that man is conducting himself in a manner that would make any whore or prostitute in history jealous. Now, if that's offensive, yeah, no, so, so be it, you know? You see, we settle for so much vomit that nobody knows the scripture anymore, taste and see that the Lord is good, you know? Taste and see yeah. that the Lord is good. And I'm sorry we got off Bigfoot tonight, but it just, you know, uh, you know, it, the, the idea is that, you know, I have to go, and I'm sorry uh, that I veered from that, but here's what I'm doing, everybody. I'm going to start putting up on my Genesis 6 giant site, long before the book goes out, a lot of the findings and stuff that will blow your mind. I have found that because of the question asked to me earlier, and I'm not mad at Andrea or Andre or whatever, the female, or even Doug, you and, you and Joe, I'm not mad at that, but I'm failing to communicate the major point. Bigfoot is an addendum. The issue is the warfare and the multidimensional attack that's coming against the people of God. And it's going to be in a realm that is both fleshy and bloody. It's going to be a unparalleled period of gore. We're already seeing things I warned about. I remember t talking, and I'm going to just tell everybody. I told everybody 20 years ago that you'll know you're in the end times when beheading becomes uh, a daily affair in the headlines, when cannibalism is no longer a rarity or a scarcity but a commonality, when human life is debased and debauched, when mankind reverts to the most animal instinct. And look, I know what it's like to live like a total uh, dog in heat, okay? That's that's the only way I, I know how before I came to Jesus, okay? So I know that part of life. And yet what I found, if the blood of Jesus is, is so efficacious and is so effective, does that mean I don't struggle? Absolutely. You guys think you come under attack? I want to thank, again, every intercessor who prays for me. I want to thank Romy, who, who spends hours in prayer coming against the attack, and then she gets physically attacked and falls down and rips her rotator cuff or is tripped, you know, or whatever. God bless you, Romy. I want to thank Manette, who weeps and prays and fasts. I want to thank Diana. I want to thank Tracy. I want to thank everybody in Bruce and Susan's congregation. These are people that are so concerned, and I want to thank Dr. and Emily for what you guys have done for me all these years, because, you know, I was told by a general, quit going on coast to coast, Steve. The guy is not, you know, going to help you. And and at one point, you know, obviously I had to leave coast to coast because of, uh, you know, some personal issues I had. Because And also because of the fact that I cannot go along with ghosts and ghouls and goblins and, and you know, uh, all that stuff anymore. It cannot be done. And, and again, Doug, as I've said before, the majority of my response from coast to coast listeners, when some shows I get up thousand emails the following day were from Christians who listen to Coast to Coast. Christians are hungry for the truth. You're either going to get it uh, with the devil's slant or you're going to get it with a biblical imperative. And then the thing that you've got to do is, look, I can give everybody 40,000 footnotes, but if they won't read and seek God and ask him to show them stuff, 90% of what I get isn't from footnotes. It's from the prayer of God's intercessors, the reason I'm not taken out. I've had people say this. I wish you would die. That way I know that, that you were telling the truth because you couldn't live if you were telling the truth. Well, yes, I can because, you know, a thousand will fall on my, or my left side, 10,000 on my right, but it's the intercessors. It's not because of moral quality in my life. I make the statement, look, I, I'm a guy who's a sinner saved by grace. I have no commendation except I have a passion for he who saved me to quit allowing pagans and the spawn of hell to mock Jesus. And trust me, if my prayers were answered, the face of the earth would be different tomorrow. 
but because the prophecy must be fulfilled, the word of God must be fulfilled, the Lord can obviously see my intent and the genuine nature of my intercession. But because his plan is greater than what I can see and his ways are greater, and I'm not even comparing myself, Lord. I'm just saying, Lord, there are certain things that should be happening just to get these guys' attention because, Lord, even as an earthly father, if someone was taking on my son and, and being ruthless and cruel and putting his picture in a vat of urine and defecating and putting all these monstrosities and calling it art, I mean, I mean trust me. Elijah's fire on the altar of the prophets of Baal would seem like uh, kindling, you know. But you see, again, there's a difference between the anger of man that does not work the righteousness of God and holy indignation. I pray for the day that the men of God and the women, by the way, I've said this, thank you women of God who are intercessors because the bravest, most powerful intercessors I met to date, minus a couple pastors, are all women. They're not women who are pastors. They are women who are praying. They're warriors. And I would rather line up with the Debras than the uh, dilettantes in the pulpit, okay? And there are mighty women of God. And, and uh, you know, here's what I want to say. But that does not give those women of God the right to become Jezebel. And that's the danger. And uh, Pastor Bruce and I had a good talk about this this week. And at some point, because I don't want to, you know, expose him to any undue uh, flack, Doug, like you and I are used to taking, you know, I just will call him that. But bless you, Brother Bruce. Bless you, Susan. Bless the entire congregation. Bless you, John and Linda. Bless you, David. Bless you, Kim. Thank you, Tracy. These are people, J.D., Jenny. Boy, thank you, Cornelius II. These are people, thank you, James P. in Colorado. These are people that have put their lives on the line, and they have stood in the gap to help others. You know, they're the ones that encourage me because they care in a loving way. And, Doug, you've been blessed by some of those people I just named. Very, you know? very much so. Very and much. so, so yes. you know, let me share this. The Bible is absolutely going to be fulfilled before us. And that's the thing that we have got to come to the grips with, okay? We have got to come to grips with. We have got to recognize, look, I don't know, and, and this is how I approach everything I do. Someone says, well, why can't you stick to Bigfoot or UFOs? Because there are issues that are bigger than that at the point. I went last night with the idea I'd do three hours. The devils that are, the powers that be, the Lucys from Lucy land made sure that they expressed themselves and, you know, shot, quote, the fire, or fired the shot across the bow. Well, praise God, we're not the good ship of lollipop, we're in the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and it's, ladies and gentlemen, I don't understand the dynamics of it, but I know this, that while well, there's yet a voice to proclaim Jesus that's still salt in this wicked earth, okay? I know the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, but I also know that God himself made the statement that he will destroy those who destroy the earth. They can basically shoot themselves in whatever part of their body with whatever uh, Methuselah gene or genetic altering drug. They can download their entire subconscious into a new duplicate of them, a clone duplicate. They can party hardy in this life and in the life they think they're going to have, but at the point that God pulls the plug on the power and the juice that's keeping them going, they're going to be like uh, uh, the, the uh, portrait of Dorian Gray, a great movie, by the way, black and white movie. But, uh, you know, his, he, his picture never uh, aged as long as the picture was uh, youthful. He was youthful, but once the mirror was broken, he aged rapidly and accelerated. Same thing with a vampire. Cut off the blood and they die. But it's the same thing in a Christian's life. If you're not transfused by the blood of Jesus, the blood, the life is in the blood, Leviticus. The power of God is in the blood. If that's offensive to you as a Christian, you better go to the altar. You better repent and get right. Because the bottom line is this is the power of God unto salvation. It's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us. The blood, it's the life of Jesus that flows. It's the heavenly transfusion that goes. It's the power of the Holy Spirit who leads, guides, and directs. It's the power of the Spirit of God that infuses with the knowledge of the Most High. And it's not by searching, do you get it? You can search the Scripture. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you do well. But they speak of me and you say, but who are you? 
So, ladies and gentlemen, I would just say, those of you who are Christians, go to the Lord. Say, Lord, is this stuff true or is it wacky? Lord, show me what I can't see. And then lay aside your bias and repent and say, Lord, if I'm being stubborn, help me to see my stubbornness. And it's amazing how God will answer a contrite heart, but he will completely avoid a proud heart. Well said. You know, and, and I think people have to know or should know the backstory. You know, Steve, when when you um, express your displeasure with with the with the mockers and the people that give you trouble, I, I just want people to imagine themselves. You know, uh, forty years having, let's say, one of the worst migraines you can have, and on top of that, have a a broken tooth and a toothache, and then you're walking around and stub your toe, and, and you're just trying to seek uh, some sort of comfort in your chair in a dark room somewhere until you can, uh, you know, get rid of your headache and your toothache and your, your painful toe. And then you've got somebody, uh, generally a righteous, uh, self-proclaimed righteous Christian, taking a sharp stick and poking at you all of the time. And imagine having that happen for 30 or 40 years like, you know, you have, Steve. Now, I'm not, I'm not making an excuse, but the mental picture here is, if I, from what I've experienced over the last year with respect to some of the most self-proclaimed righteous Christians saying, well, you should not do this or you should do that or you're wrong here and how dare you speak of this and holy cow, just my, my year of, of that as we've had this program, I can't imagine sustaining 40 years in your shoes so people should understand yeah i don't even know if i made a correct mental does that sound about right i mean you know it's just like well really yeah and it's 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 not that i'm sitting around licking my wounds but i will tell you this that um and i say this i am absolutely calling on god to control my mouth because my mouth can bless god or it can curse men okay but there comes a time when weenies who hide behind, they've never done anything, they hide behind anonymous names. I had a guy take me to task because, you know, I hurt his feeling. He sends me an anonymous email. Any of you send me anonymous emails, I think you're cowards. I think you are absolutely written in the uh, last chapter of Revelation. When those of you send me emails, yeah, I will not even answer them. I did answer this one guy, okay? Here's the thing. It's amazing that people who want anonymity, and, and I hear they're Christians. You cannot be a Christian and not care about the lost. If you don't care about the lost, if you don't care about uh, uh, eternal life, if you don't care about what God thinks of you, oh, you can think whatever. You can call, and I don't mean any disrespect to the Lord, but the God of heaven is not the tooth fairy. The God of heaven is not the Wizard of Oz. The God of heaven is not the man in the sky. When I hear people talk about the Lord, the man in the sky, it is so offensive to me. I almost want to unload with my superlatives. And trust me, I used to be known as someone who would get kicked out of public events from my mouth, okay, before I became a Christian. So the, by That's the grace of God, by the grace of God, I, I am throttling back, okay, although some of these people would do good to get throttled. But again, you know, Doug, here's what we're talking about, and let me may, maybe put this into perspective. Righteous indignation is different from the anger of man in this. Righteous indignation was what David expressed when Goliath was mocking the God of heaven. I want to put everybody into a conscience quest tonight. When's the last time you stuck up for Jesus when you could have, but you stayed silent because you were worried about what people would say? When's the last time you fell back to how God used to use you, but for 20 years, because you've been a wimp, a weenie, and a coward, you won't step up to the plate? When's the last time you basically had the opportunity to, to you saw somebody and, and, and their focus or their gaze, you knew in your heart that you should go tell them that God loves them, maybe give them a $50 bill. Well, I'm just using those as three simple things. Yet, you know what I hear all the time? I hear, well, uh, you know, God didn't call me to do that. So what did he call you to do? Sit and have a bowel movement and wait for the second coming? Because I'm not kidding you. I've literally told people, if their bowels are moving, shouldn't they try and keep up with their bowels? Somebody will say, oh, that's offensive. Listen, what's offensive is what they've got planned for the Christians. They've got planned for the Christians. Brother Bob's vision. Al Cuppet put it out, and I've had parts of it on my website. I still won't put it all up. But I can tell you this, 
the visions and dreams, even some of the visions and dreams I get, I won't put up. And I do want to answer one question. Please ask Steve about the Nephilim genetic markers that are upon us now and how to tell if someone is a Nephilim. Number one, you would have six fingers, six toes, and double sets of teeth, okay? You would have, and they can call it medically polydactylism. Number two, you would absolutely not have been able to come to Jesus because the Spirit of God only woos us. So if you're a Christian and you've come to Jesus, number three, the one question I can't answer, if you're 20% Nephilim and 80% human, are you uh, uh, still salvageable? I don't know the answer to that one, but I will say this. The Bible says, and it shall come to pass that all who call upon the name of the Lord can be delivered. If your heart is smiting you, you don't have to worry about it. That means Jesus is drawing you because no man comes into the Father except the Son draw him and that through the Holy Spirit. That's the best answer. It's not an evasive answer. And let me also say this. If you had outstanding Nephilim uh, genetic markers, your genes are already in the gene bank. The whole purpose of the Human Genome Project, I said this when it first came into being, 10 years ago, was to identify the genetic markers of the Nephilim. I, I've even had people, I had Lucius Trust send me an email making sure he knew that I blasphemed the Holy Ghost. And I sent him back a loving email saying, hell spawn, enjoy eternal damnation, okay? Unless you understand what Lucius Trust is, unless you understand what a person intentionally, intentionally uh, speaks with such vehement wickedness against the Holy Ghost, I'm sorry, but that guy's unredeemable. Or maybe that's not yeah, the correct I way saw. to say it, but he's beyond redemption. And, Doug, I sent that to you. Yeah, I saw that, and I could not believe the uh, I, I, the, the underlying uh, viciousness, the vile nature of, of those words in that email. I mean, I was I was offended just getting a, a copy of it. You know, for, I mean, not offended, but I could tell that. Uh, yeah, it's 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 just an yeah. incredible. So, time so you know, all I would say is this. If you guys hear these people, these Christians attacking me, I, you know, first of all, any of you who put up my YouTube YouTubes for the sake of those, you know, my name is copyrighted, everything's copyrighted, so anybody that puts them up. Now, I don't mind, but I'd ask that you basically, what's the word where they uh, connect that you can't post comments? You've got to know. Oh, yeah. Say, say, yeah. What, what? Disable the comments. Disable the comments, folks. Yeah, disable the comments because people need to hear what's being said. And those of you who claim to be Christians, whether you own uh, uh, the, the, the boards or whatever, you know, and, and have done your best to undermine me, destroy me and everything, God will hold the blood of the innocents on your head. And those of you who were too passive, and that's why I want to thank, uh, you know, Aftermath Bob. I want to thank you for all the years, Bill, that you have always, always stood up for, uh, you know, me as not only my friend but as, as a servant of the Lord. What's happening, Doug, is people that know nothing. It's just like this, okay? I've been in precious metals for, what is it now, I don't know, 35 years, and somehow I don't know anything but people that don't know the difference between a silver dime and a uh, wartime nickel are experts on everything, you know? Or the people, this is my favorite, well, I don't buy gold because the Bible says they're going to throw their gold in the street and it's going to canker. Oh, yeah, well, read Daniel 11:38 because the Antichrist is still to come and he's going to be worshipped with gold and silver and precious uh, stones. So the day that the gold and silver won't deliver you is in the day of the Lord. One day at the end of the tribulation when God says, my turn, you know, I mean, he's actively involved until that time, but nothing's going to save him. And that's when these people that live in their underground, I'm talking about the Illuminati, live in their underground cities and think they got it all made, you know, with all of their mistresses and madness. That's when the glory of the Lord will go into the deepest labyrinths of the earth that will go to the deepest uh, uh, hideaways of the universe. And instantly will the Lord Jesus slay them with the breath of his mouth. Listen, God is a mighty, 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 mighty general of the hosts of heaven. When it says Lord of hosts, that literally means the captains are the generals of the armies of heaven. And so, ladies and gentlemen, you can either get right with Jesus or you can continue to be in your petty bickering world where you could not and would not help anybody if their lives depended on it. And because of your sin, selfishness, arrogance, and pride, you will do everything to block the word of anybody who's preaching uh, Jesus, that men might turn to Jesus and be saved. 
And I, I, I absolutely, Doug, by the grace of God, I know I'd better stop now because with my, with, uh, again, James says, with your tongue you bless God. I have never been more uh, amazed at the amount of self-righteous, do-nothing, anonymous cowards that will bust my... Um, my, I'm okay, that will bust my bottom, and yet they have never done anything, and they're so worried that they might be on the government's list. For those of you who live in that realm, let me tell you something. You better be worried that your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, because if the angels of heaven grant any man the greatest gift that I think God would give, it would be to see that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, because if it isn't, you're in the Book of the Dead, and the Book of the Dead is the Book of the Damned. And it's uh, it's it's a forever book. Yeah, I'm surprised, uh, Steve. At, at the, just assume your your name is written in the uh, in the books of man, where you know in, in the DHS or whoever is doing the the uh, monitoring at any given time. Just assume that you're already there. Uh, but, but but be more concerned, as you say, that, that your book, either your name is written in the book of life, um, because I think that, that, I mean that that's that's what we're talking about. And, and this was said to me exactly this way today this is for all of the marbles and I, I said that yesterday it was said to me yesterday this is for what we're talking about what steve's talking about is for all the marbles i mean this is this is the end game is it not steve i mean this is it and doug i think you should tell the people because again i don't know your source but did he not tell you that i'm telling the people the truth and let me say something when he's at the level he's at he's had to have had cosmic clearance He's had to have had, you know, cosmic clearance. If you don't know what that is, don't give me the stuff about, well, I have top secret clearance. And my, my grandfather was in World War II, says Quail's crazy. 28 steps above you, pal, unless you know what Majestic 12 is, you can't even start in that argument. That's not meant to be proud. It's meant to put people into the realization. I didn't give you a chance to ask, did he not say that? As if you need endorsement. Absolutely, he said that. He said that 100% that, that your sources, that your information is 100% accurate. In fact, uh, he went further and said that you probably, um, you could go, yeah, but people wouldn't understand because he, he thinks that you've got more in your intellectually to give than you've given, and I think you've done that for the grace of people. You know, for for like you said, you can't go into the graphics, or you have chosen not to the, the graphic scenes and scenarios it's real but but yes i mean to answer your question yes absolutely he said you're 100 percent accurate uh that this person has that that knowledge and clearance and and uh, the context himself so no i mean you were yeah 100 percent yep and, and again the only thing i'm trying to tell people is this look i want to see faithfulness with what i've already given there are people that absolutely have responded those people I share with. And when I, I love this. I get the anonymous email, and I, this is a good place to close. Tell me what you really know. Well, like, uh, you know, it's like that <laughs> statement, you know, you can handle the truth. I have a little different <laughs> spin on this. Say, what have you done with anything or all of what I've already told you, you know? And, and it's, it's like, it's like exactly. the people, you know, the nameless people, you know. Well, the nameless people are... Uh, the voices, they're just basically the VOD, V-O-D, okay? That's the voice of the devil. And look, I, can, I understand criticism, and I understand that there are people who are easily offended. I understand that. But, you know, Jesus even had to make the statement, look, put me aside, but take the words I'm speaking. Go look up the scriptures, and don't settle for moron A or moron B telling you what they think, when obviously if they could think, they wouldn't be morons. That's kind of a basic maxim. Exactly, Steve. And with that, we are up against the close of the show. I want to thank you, my friend. Uh, Genesis, Genesis 6 Giants, that's Genesis, the number 6 Giants, and stevequail.com. I want to thank you very much for coming on, sharing, my brother, with everything you Thank you, Doug. Sharing. And listen, ladies and gentlemen, my yeah. books are only available on my website. Please get Aliens and Fallen Angels and, and Angel Wars. They're the two books that will equip you for the most perilous time in the world that's upon us now. God bless you, everyone. God bless you, Steve. Thank you very much, my friend. Yeah, uh, what a great show, and I'm glad we got through.